welcome to the Open Apple podcast, where we celebrate the Apple II. Whether you're a long-time user, a nostalgic visitor, or a newcomer to the community, join us as we share news and memories of Steve Wozniak's most famous personal computer. Hello and welcome to Open Apple. This is episode 58 for April 2016. I am your co-host of the first, Queen Donkey. With me as always is co-host of the second, Mike McGinnis. How are you doing, Mike? I'm losing my mind here, Quinn. I, I one <laughs> one day I've got 18 inches of snow on the ground. The next day it's 70, and then it's snowing again. I, it's I, I I can't do anything except record podcasts. I guess. <laughs> I've heard you had some crazy weather up there. Yeah, it's kind of nuts. Yeah. How are you? Uh, good, good. It's been crazy down here in SoCal too. Uh, yesterday it was 70, and today it's 71, and oh, tomorrow it's supposed to be 70 again. Like it's just the temperature. How do you all deal with that? Place. I know Goodness. it's crazy. I'm so I, sorry. I do it. Do I wear a light jacket or a slightly less white light jacket? I don't know. It just it's it's madness. I'll send you a relief box of like stuff that can snow. help a little fan to put on your desk and some ice. <laughs> That's right. Send me some snow. Yes. <laughs> it's weird. Mike sent me a soggy cardboard box. <laughs> <laughs> what is he trying to say? Uh, are you looking forward to Kansas Fest? Uh, I am. I am definitely looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, it's getting close. Fact, uh, yeah, I hope someone comes to Kansas Fest with an Apple II in a uh, Taiwanese ham box, which uh, will, will make sense later. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little preview of our uh, upcoming interview. Or just, you know, <laughs> random stuff that Quinn says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, depending on, maybe that bit will get edited out and then the I think so. will make no, <laughs> no sense at all. Oh, well. Anyway, uh, Taiwanese mm-hmm. ham, lol. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's you, our, that's our, uh, our, our out, outtake blooper. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, I guess Quinn we should actually Taiwanese talk about Apple II stuff. stuff. Yeah, let's do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, have, you, have you had any <laughs> retro stuff lately, Mike? Well, I watched uh, Pirates of Silicon Valley again, um, and I hadn't seen that in quite some time. I, I was going through an old box and found a... Uh, a DVD that I had converted from VHS, so it was ugly, ugly as far as quality, but I think still the best of the Apple history movies that that have come out. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've actually seen it, or if I did, it was a long time ago. So I guess I should watch it again. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's of course Hollywoodized and scenes added for you know scenes created for dramatic effect and that sort of thing. But I think of all of them, it is the mo- it is the the least either worshipful or hysterical or least angry or whatever you want to call it. You know, the, it has the least agenda, nothing to say other than this is what happened. So uh, a lot of fun. And if you haven't seen it, shame on you. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that was written and produced before Steve Jobs died is better because there wasn't the sort of, you know, the myth, the man, the legend that they had to live up to, or there was, there's, I think there was less revisionism going on. I mean, it was still, there's still some of that, you know, the oh, sure. history books were written by the winners and all that, but uh, as the Commodore people will lament, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I think the, yeah, the quality of the retrospectives, both, you know, as we get further away from the actual events and after Steve Jobs' death, I think it has gotten a lot worse. There's a, there's an article on Cult of Mac. It's actually, I guess, a couple of years old now. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes, of course. But they, they interviewed the, the director of Pirates of Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, at the time, Steve Jobs didn't have any comment on it, of course, and Bill Gates didn't either, and, as you would expect. But um, I guess at, at one of the following Macworld Expos, uh, they had um, Noah Wiley, who played Steve Jobs in the movie, come up on stage and pretend to be him for <laughs> for part of the intro to the keynote. So I thought at first – that, oh, well, Jobs must have liked it. But apparently the, the director said that um, at one point he had like access to people at Apple and St- and he had talked to Steve and that all went away after the movie came out. He said Steve never talked to him again and he could not get a hold of anybody at Apple. So oh, that was interesting. <laughs> wow, interesting. Um, yeah. um, and the other thing that I've been thinking of lately is my collection. I have a lot of Apple II stuff. And um, this is sort of what got me thinking about it was there's a discussion over on uh, Compsys Apple II uh, about, you know, what happens when people get older and they die to their collections. And sadly, I think a lot of them just end up in dumpsters and stuff. Um, but it got me thinking, you know, do I do I write this stuff into my will somehow? Do I just get rid of it all before, you know, the, the, the coffin closes? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of things. I hate to admit this because I, I hate thinking of myself as the hoarder pack rat that I am. 
But I have a lot of Apple II stuff, and most of it never gets used. And I feel I've kind of gotten to that point where, like, maybe I should find a few choice machines that mean something to me and donate the rest. But, you know, the, the idea of piecemealing it out on eBay just sounds like, you know, a whole lot of sweat and work for $20 here, $10 there for stuff. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'll just load it up and drag it all to Kansas Fest to the Sean's giveaway or something. Yeah, that seems like a honestly the best option because, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, I have a lot of stuff that I probably don't want anymore, uh, not even just retro computing stuff, but just other stuff. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, I could eBay it, but that's such a pain in, pain in the butt. And uh, for, like you said, such kind of minimal returns for most of this stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think Kansas Fest is, is the way to go get it get it into the hands of some, some people that will like it. Uh, yeah, there's actually a... Uh, there's an episode of uh, Retro Computing Roundtable where they talked a lot about this. Uh, I'll see if I can dig up the episode and link it in the show notes. But uh, oh, those jerks even they, scooped us on that, man! <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> and it was months ago. How did they do that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, they talked about this a lot. And one of the <laughs> one of the really salient points I think they brought up was that you know our poor relatives who are going to inherit this these piles of crap. Uh, don't necessarily know what's valuable and what isn't. So you know they don't know a Rev Zero Apple II from you know a high serial number two plus like it just not, not, none of it means anything to them so they're they might just toss it all so i think i think it was maybe paul hagstrom who suggested uh putting just putting a post-it note on things saying valuable <laughs> and not valuable right <laughs> uh, and that way your relatives will know what what to ebay or what to auction and what to uh throw away <laughs> yeah well it, it occurred to me as well that you know some of us have the the, the, the fortune to live long lives and you kind of know when the end is coming, I guess, but you never know when you're going to get hit by a bus. And so it's sort of like on my mind that, I, you know, obviously I'm not hoping that I die next week, but it would be good to get this <laughs> taken care of sooner rather than later. So um, I have a lot to sort out and not much space to do it in. So we'll see how frustrated and angry I get. <laughs> All right. That got a little <laughs> dark there, Mike. <laughs> uh, what? Oh, um, let me cut that out. <laughs> Marker here. Edit, edit. <laughs> Uh, good stuff. All right. Uh, well, um, shall we roll on into our interview? Sure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to talking to uh, our next guest. Yeah. Hi, this is David from the Retro Computing Roundtable, and you're listening to the Open Apple Podcast. All right. So uh, this month, uh, we are sitting down and talking to Hybert Albers, uh, a name you probably recognize if you're a 2GS fan. Uh, he wrote Soundsmith. Um, that's incredible. Amazing. And he wrote a couple of games. So why don't we just jump into the interview? Hello, Hybert. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Thank you for joining us today. Well, it's, uh, it's great to spend some time talking uh, Apple II again. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm really enthused to to hear about um how you arrived at Soundsmith, but but first let's let's start back at the very beginning. Um a question we like to ask all of our um um interviewees, apologies to Quinn, is uh if you um what's wh give us your first experience with the Apple II and why you went with that. Well, actually, it, it took me some time to settle on the uh, Apple II because uh I didn't have uh, much money to buy a computer, so uh, uh, before I actually bought my uh, my first Apple II, uh, I started playing around with um, programmable uh, uh, calculators, and uh, even that was uh, kind of uh, uh, by chance, because uh, I had been uh, saving money to buy uh, a small uh, moped. <laughs> And uh, that's something that uh, every 14-year-old in Switzerland wants to buy uh, once uh, they get to that age. And I started saving money for that uh, two, year, uh, two years before uh, my 14th uh, birthday. And it turns out that I worked uh, way too hard and I had some uh, extra money uh, to, buy, uh, to, to buy something else. So I, uh, I took my bike and... Uh, I was going to buy um, a Walkman because uh, in the 80s, if you had uh, no Walkman, you were absolutely no one. That was the gadget <laughs> everyone uh, had to have. So uh, I was going to buy uh, uh, the Walkman and I went to the store and at the entrance were all the programmable uh, calculators. 
And there was a Texas instrument uh, calculator, a TI-58, that I had been uh, uh, looking and looking. And, uh, so, and for some reason, on that day, they had a one open box TI-58 that was half price. So that's where my... Uh, I never bought uh, a Walkman, so uh, my uh, <laughs> career in music uh, was gone. But uh, I bought that uh, calculator, and uh, I spent uh, one year programming uh, the TI-58, which was uh, a great introduction to assembly language, because basically it's uh, the same concepts. And um, after that, I joined the computer club, and I uh, started using uh, the Tandy Radio Shack 80 uh, model one it was a it was a nice computer but i never bought it because uh, when you went to a tandy radio shack store uh, the sales people were all over you and uh, when you were a 14 year old that uh, that's something you you don't really really like so um i started looking at other computers and uh, i had a friend uh, from uh, Taiwan and uh, his family still lived over there and uh, he bought uh, an Apple II clone and it was called the Orange II that was a very or original name and uh, <laughs> it was exactly like an Apple II Plus and uh, we started playing games and it was a, a great computer I remember playing uh, Star Blaster with him uh, no, Star, Star Blazer, so, sorry and that was a, a game that uh, really had me excited. You had those uh, missile, uh, the heat seeking missiles that were uh, trying to get you. And uh, uh, I saw the name of the programmer on the screen uh, and uh, they say, that's what I want to do. I want to write games. So um, one year later, when uh, my parents decided to leave Switzerland and move to Spain, I had... Uh, uh, to sell a couple of stuff that uh, that I couldn't take with me, and I used the money to ask him to, and uh, buy uh, an orange too from Taiwan. And a couple of weeks uh, later, there was a big box filled with uh, Taiwanese delicatessen because uh, they didn't want uh, this to seem that they were importing uh, <laughs> computers. So wow. it was a gift from the family with. Uh, a Taiwanese ham and other things inside, <laughs> and, uh, and an orange. There, there, and an orange too. And there was my uh, my first Apple II computer, which I enjoyed very much. <laughs> I think I think that has to be one of the best origin stories that we've heard for uh, for an Apple II programmer. So uh, then, of course, um, how you know you're most known for your work on the 2GS so how did you go from the 2 plus then did you move to other apple 2 models or did you jump straight to the 2GS at some point or how did that go no i uh, i actually started on the uh, on the apple 2 and uh, uh, at the beginning i was uh, uh, trying to understand how uh, those uh, great games were programmed and uh, it seemed uh, quite uh, difficult because uh, you had all those instructions that moved by it from one place to another. But uh, uh, that was very far from a full game. So uh, it took me a while to understand. And I actually uh, got an issue from uh, Call Apple that explained uh, high resolution graphics. And that's where I finally understood how everything work worked. And uh, so... So starting with that, I uh, uh, I, uh, I started writing uh, simple games and uh, and uh, also uh, I participated in uh, in uh, well it it was kind of uh, you you had to program uh, something and you could uh, get a, a, a prize and award uh, for for young people in in Spain. So uh, I wrote a basic. Uh, editor very similar to uh, GPLE I don't know if you remember that program and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't win so I, I spent about three months working on that and all I got was uh, a record <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but still uh, I was very proud of my record and, uh, and, and my friends knew I was programming so uh, one day one of my friends said uh, look uh, we have uh, uh, this company, they publish books for schools and they uh, 
they would like to, uh, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, educational software. So they would like to, uh, to have a tool that would allow them to, uh, to build their own courseware. So oh, that, 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 look, uh, that looks like fun. So uh, I started working on that project. And it was called uh, Teachers with us, Wizard. And um, that program was uh, like an early hypercard because you could uh, have images and you could press on sections of the images and that would uh, move you to another image and give you some explanation. And uh, it was quite a complex um, application because you had uh, the, uh, the possibility to build... Um, uh, questions and tests for the students and uh, uh, those tests will would uh, eventually be uh, corrected automatically by the computer so um, uh, when I finished that program they, they paid me in Spain and uh, since I didn't have much money I said well you can keep the rights for Spain but I'm keeping the rights for the rest of the world and uh, what happened then is uh, I took the money, bought a ticket to fly to uh, San Francisco, to uh, the Apple Fest. And uh, I tried to sell the, the program uh, in the United States. And I was lucky enough to, uh, to meet some, uh, some people at uh, Britannica Software. And they were interested. And so we started talking and uh, they, uh, we signed a contract and they... Uh, asked for a couple of changes and then more changes. So in the end, there were so many changes that uh, the Apple II market started to uh, to decline uh, before the uh, program was uh, finished. And uh, the program was never published. But uh, they started telling me, look, uh, we are interested in publishing uh, games and products for the Apple II GS. Do you have something? And by that time, I uh, I had moved to France. I was living in Bordeaux, and uh, I had uh, bought the uh, Apple II GS on day one. And I was trying to find out what could be done with that computer. So uh, over a weekend, I wrote a very simple game uh, uh, called uh, Jigsaw, and uh, and they liked it which was uh, quite surprising because uh, I was not especially proud of that product. But they say, no, 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 we want to sell it. And they say, yeah, sure, because we could do this and we could do that and it could be much better. No, 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 we want to sell it as is. And they started selling that crappy product because there's no other way to, uh, to describe it. And it was actually uh, very successful. I mean, we sold way over 100,000 copies uh, on the Apple II GS and on the Amiga and uh, on the Mac. Uh, I didn't write those versions, but uh, but I was really surprised that I could uh, actually make money from uh, a weekend worth of work. Then I discovered that uh, that doesn't always uh, work like that because then I spent one year working on, on uh, Laser Force and that program, which uh, which I was much more pleased with, didn't even reach uh, the uh, 10,000 copies mark. So uh, you never know. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, 100,000 copies is uh, very impressive, for especially for anything on the 2GS. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, was, it was very popular with schools. And uh, I remember once we went to another Apple Fest in Boston and uh, uh, we were showing uh, all the uh, products at the uh, Britannica booth. And uh, there were two nuns over there, and uh, and they were looking at Jigsaw and said, "Look, this is a great game that we have and that we use at school, and uh, we love it." And I was very proud to hear those two nuns speaking so uh, nicely about my program. And then they moved to the next computer, which was uh, running Laser Force. And uh, one of the nuns said, "What's that?" And the other said, "That's another game of death and destruction." And I was uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, I, 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 that was the last uh, time I uh, I worked on a game. <laughs> <laughs> so so then, how did you go from from the games to uh, Soundsmith? Well, I actually needed uh, some music for Laser Force, and uh, uh, I had many friends. Uh, 
who had uh, moved from the Apple to, to the Amiga. And at the time, uh, well, uh, uh, you're, when, when you don't have money to buy multiple systems, you easily become a fanboy because uh, your, pro your computer has to be the best and you need to, to demonstrate that. So, um, so they were showing me all those uh, mod players that uh, were playing great music and they only had four different uh, channels. And uh, we had nothing like that on the uh, on the Apple II GS. I mean, there were some products like uh, the uh, Music Studio and so on, but those were pretty bad because they were ports from other uh, platforms. And uh, in order to uh, simplify the uh, uh, the port, they would use only up to four instruments, and uh, all the instruments had to be uh, 32 kilobytes in length, so that there was no uh, no problem fitting the uh, the uh, sound um, samples into the uh, dock memory. So um, I, I, I one day I got fed, fed up and say, "How is it possible that uh, this Amiga computer plays better music than the 2GS?" And I told my friend, "Please copy me the uh, the file. I want to take a look at uh, the file format." Because at the time there was no internet, there was no readily available documentation on uh, how this worked. So uh, I started looking at the file format and uh, uh, my friends explained how, uh, how this worked. And I started uh, writing that uh, on the Apple II GS. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy because uh, at the beginning I was using uh, the tools and the uh, the Apple tools were really terrible. I mean, uh, filled with bugs. They were basically unusable. So I had to go uh, to the hardware and try to uh, to get the maximum out of um, of the hardware we had. And I only had one song, and that song was uh, Cambodia by Kim Weld. And that song is. Um, basically burned into my uh, brain because I listened to it <laughs> so many times <laughs> before actually getting it right that uh, it's still uh, a song that uh, I, I can't get off, out of my mind to this day. <laughs> and finally, when it worked out, well, I was extremely proud, but uh, we needed a, an editor and uh, that took me quite a while. I mean, uh, in fact, I was able to... Uh, to finish Laser Force with uh, uh, music composed by some of uh, my friends who lived also in Bordeaux, and um, and uh, I had to uh, I spent almost one year working on the editor and uh, trying to make it uh, as uh, Mac like as possible. I really wanted the uh, the Apple II GS to have uh, uh, more. Uh, well, more programs that would uh, use the toolbox, and uh, uh, in that regard, I was very different from uh, many of the uh, French names that you have heard before uh, from the FDA, who <laughs> should uh, call yeah. themselves the uh, not the uh, Free Tools Associations, but the Tools Free Association. But uh, I guess they, uh, <laughs> That's right. they they made a, they they made a mistake there with their English at the time. But um, <laughs> they hated tools. They wanted this to be a standard Apple II, and uh, which you would use without the help of any tools. And uh, I pretty much love the idea of having uh, a cheap uh, Mac uh, at my disposal. So. Uh, I wrote a couple of NDAs and uh, and, and I wanted uh, SongSmith uh, to be uh, launchable from a hard disk drive and uh, to be able to uh, to work nicely with uh, other desktop based uh, products and uh, took me a while but uh, I was pretty satisfied with the results. Yeah, I'd say you're very successful. <laughs> well, That's, I, I, uh, that I, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to say that uh, I think that uh, 
uh, the all uh, GS world was waiting for something like that because uh, we hadn't been able to show all the potential of uh, of our computer, and that uh, that is something that uh, we all wanted to explore. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, I mean, for anyone in our audience who doesn't know, I mean, it's hard to hard to overstate the impact that SoundSmith had on the platform. You know, as you say the Uh, It needed music composition software that really took advantage of the hardware so desperately. And uh, so I wondered, when you were building it, I mean, you know, you mentioned you were heavily influenced by the Amiga, you know, tracking programs. Uh, Did you have a sense of sort of the significance of tracking uh, as a way to compose music uh, as opposed to uh, the sort of the other, you know, the more commercial software that tried to do it with, you know, the classic dragging notes onto a scale, you know, that a lot of uh, programs tried to do sort of that, you know, trying to map the paper and pencil metaphor of composition onto computers. Whereas I think that the the tracking paradigm is a much better fit for composition of electronic music on computers. It makes much more sense, uh, especially when you get into, you know, looping and things like that with the blocks. So did you have the sense did you, of the importance of what you were doing? Or was it just more a case of, oh, these are what the Amiga people did, and so I'm going to try it? Or Well, that was exactly the case. I had never learned anything about music in my whole life. It was just a case of being fed up with my friends showing off and, uh, and, and and that was it. I mean, <laughs> I, the, 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 I, I couldn't believe no one, no one had uh, done it. And uh, I said, <laughs> well, if no one's doing it, I have to do it. So that, that's it. I mean, and uh, I, ha- I, I had to learn <laughs> a lot about music, especially when uh, I wrote version 101, which included support for MIDI. I had no clue what they were talking about. I mean, this was totally new for me. And I was just trying to um, to do what people were asking for. But it's quite difficult when, uh, uh, when you have uh, had absolutely no musical education. <laughs> well, I, I can't think of any better reason to write something than to trash talk your friends. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> So that that's interesting that you had actually no music background. Uh, I had read that the title song for Soundsmith, which I like very, very much, uh, was one that you had written. Is that true? No, that's not true. It's a friend of mine uh, whose initials are JCD. And uh, I don't even remember his uh, whole name right now. I, uh, <laughs> I contacted him a, a couple of years ago through... Um, to Facebook, but uh, we haven't been in touch. So uh, no, no, uh, I had absolutely uh, no, no, uh, no musical skills, and I still don't. But he, but he was uh, he was he was pretty good, and uh, he wrote uh, maybe two or three uh, uh, original songs, and uh, and he he used uh, most of uh, the available. Uh, tracks and uh and that that definitely helped uh push the uh the limits on, on the platform and then uh, many uh, musicians decided to uh, start using uh, the product and uh, th- there's a pretty uh, large library of uh, of songs uh, today that only run on on the Apple 2GS uh, you you sold uh, Soundsmith as shareware is that right yeah i uh I had absolutely no expectations of making uh, any money, and uh, and I was uh, quite surpri- surprised when I started getting uh, twenty dollar bills in uh, in my mailbox. And uh, well, it certainly helped me uh, through college to uh, to get some additional uh, money. It wasn't lots of money. I mean, uh, today when you hear people complaining that you can't make a lot of money from the uh, from the Apple Store. Uh, in fact, the situation hasn't changed. I mean, uh, when you wrote uh, software back in, uh, in the 80s, uh, yes, you could charge more money. Uh, charging 20 bucks today is very difficult. But then there were about uh, 1 million uh, 2GSs and uh, there's a billion Apple devices now in the wild. So... Uh, it should be easier to make more money today. and uh, But still, I mean, you have no idea how happy I was every day when uh, 
I was coming back from university and uh, and opened my mailbox and there was uh, a letter from uh, Australia, Canada, U.S. I mean, it's uh, it it was really nice and uh, I have kept uh, those letters. They're still uh, at my parents' home in Spain and. Uh, uh, the fact is, I I really enjoyed uh, getting uh, the money was nice, but uh, those who spent some uh, some time writing uh, about the, how they used the product and how they enjoyed it, that was uh, that was really great. I imagine that's um, that sounds very gratifying. Did did you happen to keep track of how many total copies you sold? Well, I had a database on my hard disk drive, but uh, my hard disk drive is dead. Oh, so <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> I've tried to connect it back to my 2GS and the 2GS uh, still works like a champ, but uh, the hard disk drive doesn't spin. So uh, it seems like there's something bad there. But uh, I think it was uh, about 2,000 people. Oh, wow. That's still pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And uh uh, and so, so some of those letters came uh, with a list of uh, 20 people who had uh, joined forces together to send a check. Uh, and that was quite amazing. Wow, that's that's really nice. Yeah. Um, now, because it was shareware, how did you advertise it? Did you, did you have a publishing company or was this just all word of mouth? No, this was word of mouth. And the wow. fact is... Uh, uh, at the time, I didn't have to support any family, or so uh, this was just for fun. And uh, I basically decided it was shareware because everyone else was doing the same. But as I told you, I had absolutely no expectations to make any money from this, and it was a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I, I, I think SoundSmith might be one of those products that probably would have failed if it had been commercial because you know that tracker style of electronic music production wasn't you know mainstream at the time and it was something that you know demo writers and game writers and independent musicians are doing and still do but it wasn't you know outside of the midi space it wasn't the kind of thing that uh, you know it wasn't a paradigm of music composition that i think uh, uh, the mainstream would have appreciated so that's uh, uh it's probably for the best that you uh, went so uh, went shareware with it yeah, but uh, I, I uh, certainly hope that uh, many Apple to GS uh, users had much fun with and uh, that they were able to show them to their Amiga friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> yeah, the number of voices was just fantastic. Every so often you'd get one of those tracks that used, you know, 12 or 13 voices, and, and that was amazing. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think I can speak for the 2GS community when I say that SoundSmith has to be on everyone's short list, probably top three of, you know, favorite pieces of software on the entire platform. So thank you very much uh, for having done that. Um, switching gears a little bit now, you uh, you mentioned your love of tools, and uh, I wondered if you, did you have any involvement with the uh, tool that came along later? I think it was called Tool 219 uh, for playing SoundSmith tracks in, you know, your own software. No, I uh, I wasn't involved with that. Uh, although I uh, I've seen it, and uh, but I haven't uh, uh, actually found any documentation, so I'll have to t uh, take a look. But there's another tool that plays uh, a competing file format, right? From uh, from FTA, I think. Uh... Yeah, I think Tool Two Nineteen actually came from FTA, or at least they were distributing it. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't well documented, so I don't know a lot of things that used it, but. Um... And then, yeah, I think later they came along with Tool 220 or something, which played uh, noise tracker files. And that actually leads me to my next that's question. It. I that's wondered, it. Yeah. I wondered if you kept up with the sort of the music tracking genre on the platform, because things like Noise Tracker and uh, Synth Lab came along later. Did you sort of stay involved in that? Were you interested in those other products as well? Or? Well, certainly I, I downloaded uh, Synth Lab because it came from Apple and uh, I wanted to know what they were doing. And I think they went in the wrong direction. I mean, I don't think that's what uh, people wanted. And as for Noise Tracker, I, uh, I think that uh, they went uh, slightly further because I, I tried to use only uh, uh, 14 channels to keep, uh, uh, to keep uh, one, one, well, two channels available because that's what the... Uh, the documentation was uh, from Apple said that uh, 
you, one of the channels had to be reserved for the systems uh, for the system to work. And I think they uh, they produced uh, songs with uh, sixteen uh, channels. So um, and maybe the format was more efficient because uh, one of the things I wasn't very proud of is uh, is the fact that. Uh, uh, in my file format, you had to uh, keep all 14 voices, even if uh, if one of the tracks was not, was not used. So I, I was uh, I was very concerned with the uh, bad use of uh, of bytes at the time. So that's something that uh, modern programmers don't seem to understand. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the SoundSmith file format and how it differed from the Amiga mod format? So uh, basically, it's uh, it's very similar. At the beginning, at the header, you have uh, the name of the instruments, and uh, SoundSmith would uh, try to load all those instruments in sequence. So uh, one of uh, of the peculiarities of the um, of the dock memory is that depending on the uh, on the sample uh, of the size of the samples you can load a different number of uh, instruments. So if you have one 32K uh, sample, then the number of other samples uh, is... Uh, you, you don't have all the options. You can't use those 64Ks as you, as you want. So um, one of the things that was nice with uh, uh, SoundSmith is that it would take all the sounds and optimize the use of those 64 Ks so that it could fit as much samples as possible. And uh, that's something that uh, previous programs on the uh, Apple II GS had uh, avoided. And they said, well, it's just four samples and they're all 16 K and that's it. And this one would try to fit as many samples as possible. And uh, that allowed uh, to uh, produce better sounding um, uh, music and uh, so that was one thing and after that you had uh, the information uh, in uh, different tracks and uh, each track was uh, divided I believe it was uh, 64 notes and uh, each note would normally be played in a multiple of a 60th of a second so you could change the uh, the rhythm by playing it every 60th or every two sixtieths of a, of a second. And so the, this, uh, this was something that, uh, as you said, was very well uh, designed for electronic uh, dance music, but it's not something uh, very well, well suited to other types of music. The problem with my file format is that it always saved the information for all 14 tracks even if the music only had four tracks. And that's something that I'm still banging my head that I didn't fix at some point. But <laughs> <laughs> I may still do that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, consider doing a sequel to Soundsmith? Well, not, not really to Soundsmith. I, uh, I, I would like to, uh, to write again some, uh, some programs for the uh, Apple IIGS to make sure that... Uh, I remember how memory wa was so valuable and how we had to count every single cycle because that's something that we still we, we don't do anymore and we waste so much uh, computing power in our current uh, products that uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I was having a, a discussion with uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, last week and I was telling him, look, we are spending 40 milliseconds here and uh, the, in, in, in this operation, which offers absolutely no value. We should get rid of that. And he told me, 40 milliseconds, what are you talking about? It's nothing. And uh, I tried to explain how many instructions you could run on the, uh, on the Apple II GS in that uh, time frame. <laughs> but he was born in a different generation. He couldn't understand it. And uh, that's just too bad because we are wasting so many CPU cycles right now that uh, we need to to try to... Uh, now, now that uh, 
Moore's law is no longer working, we'll probably have to go back and uh, try to optimize our code the way we did uh, in the past. Yeah, that's very true. We talk about that on the show a lot, actually, that, yeah, like a modern USB keyboard has more horsepower in it than an Apple II did. Uh, you know, USB is yeah. a complicated protocol that we just throw horsepower at it and just burn cycles. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting sort of uh, waste of resources. <laughs> it is. Now, in uh, 2012, you... You released all three of those of your your titles as freeware. Can you talk about that? Well, actually, I think I I did it uh, slightly earlier, but uh, oh, okay. But I, I've uh, redesigned my website a couple of times, so uh, that's maybe the reason. Uh, I think that uh, that many people uh, still want to uh, to play uh, uh, games and other titles on a vintage computer and. Uh, this uh, so, is something that we shouldn't uh, lose. I mean, I, I've been following what uh, 4AM and Not One Vigno have been doing, and I think it's ex- extremely important. I mean, many of, uh, uh, of those titles had uh, great ideas, and we can still learn from that. And, uh, and some of those games were extremely fun. Maybe someone will want to take a look at them and uh, write... Uh, a newer version with better graphics, but it's part of our culture and I don't think we should lose it. Definitely. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, laser force actually coming as it did sort of late in the li- uh, lifetime of the platform, I think is, is underappreciated. So we'll definitely link to that. We, I would recommend everyone give that a try. Well, it was a fun project because, uh, I wanted a game that uh, would allow, uh, players to create their own levels and uh, I didn't see many new levels built with the with the tool, but uh, but still, I think that uh, that's something that uh, usually uh, players enjoy. And I would see that I would like to see more more games where where you can build your own levels. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, I think of it as sort of the isometric load runner in uh, in that way. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, uh, I had a friend. Uh, uh, in Spain, who had written uh, uh, that ver- that program for the Apple II, and uh, I think it's uh, unfortunately lost. But uh, he wrote that uh, game and he published it in Spain, and uh, that was probably not a very good idea because the uh, Apple II market in Spain was uh, uh, actually quite small, and uh, he was probably the only Spaniard who bought an Apple II GS because you had to. The product was not sold in Spain. And uh, I was the other one because I bought it in France and they moved to Spain. And so uh, we spent a lot of time talking Apple to GS together because we were the only ones who had uh, an Apple to GS in the whole country. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he showed me that game. And uh, so I decided to, uh, to port it uh, to the Apple to GS. Uh, more than a port, it was... Uh, Something that I wrote from scratch, but uh, but it, it was fun, even on the Apple II. So when you were working on, uh, when you were in Bordeaux working on on uh, Soundsmith and so on, uh, were you sort of associated with the? I mean, France was well known for having a big 2GS community. Uh, were you associated with those other folks at all, or uh, you mentioned the sort of dichotomy you had with philosophically with uh, tools or no tools? But were you? Uh, did you work with them at all, or was there kind of a community there? We we knew each other, and the fact is, we were all big time pirates, and uh, we exchanged <laughs> uh, floppies on a weekly basis. <laughs> so uh, yeah. uh, uh, the uh, the number of floppies that went from Bordeaux to Dijon and Paris and uh, other places, and uh, even to Geneva, where. Uh, Mr. Z, Dominique Delay was based and in other uh, places uh, that probably helped uh, maintain the, uh, the operations of uh, the uh, French uh, post for quite a while but um, we yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, I, I think the impact of uh, piracy of, of declining piracy on the Apple II is probably uh, something that uh, explains why uh, the post office isn't uh, the same as it was in, uh, back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. 
but uh, but we didn't uh, talk much on the phone and exchange programming tips and so on. I mean, uh, they had a very strong uh, team and. Uh, and at the beginning, it was all about the piracy, and then they uh, moved on uh, uh, developing their own software, and uh, and then they uh, some of them even uh, participated in writing a book on the Apple two GS, and uh, so uh, I I think that uh, uh, we learned a lot from uh, the, those years, and uh, it was fun for everyone. I don't think we uh, we killed the software market because. Uh, uh, I at least was way too broke to buy uh, software on my own. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, I bought uh, Ultima three, and I think uh, maybe I've bought another game in uh, in all those years. But uh, that was all I could afford. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right about that. That's a myth that uh, every pirated copy is a lost sale. I think uh, those of us that pirated this stuff wouldn't have bought it anyway because we didn't have any money. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that's a, that's the the problem when you're a student. You have a lot of time and uh, but not a lot of money. <laughs> yes, now we're older and we have lots of money and not a lot of time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it was more fun the other way around. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Now, as as a game programmer yourself, uh, what was your what was your? I assume that you played games. What was your favorite game that wasn't yours? Well, uh, uh, Star Star Blazer really uh, caused an impact. I mean, uh, I I, re- I remember that game from the Apple II days, and uh, I had uh, lots of fun uh, with uh, with that program. And obviously, Karateka, that was a, a great game. That that's probably my favorite. And I finally paid it, paid for it when I bought the uh, the iPhone oh, version. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I haven't played the game actually on my iPhone, but uh, I wanted to pay the author because uh, that was a great game. I mean, uh, it's probably <laughs> the the most you could get out of the Apple II in terms of uh, fluid graphics, and uh, uh, there was even a storyline. I mean, it, it was it was a great game. Just thirty some years later, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, all of those who uh, listen to the, uh, to your podcast and uh, haven't paid for that game, now's the <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, are you still active at all in in the hobbyist community as it exists today? Do you is your two GS out and working? Yeah, my two GS works, and uh, this year I spent. So much money on it, I can't believe it. I, uh, I, I've bought a, a four megabyte uh, card. I uh, bought the U- 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 Ethernet card. I've uh, bought the uh, SD card, the uh, the SD drive card, and I hadn't spent so much money on my eight, uh, on my two GS since the eighties. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I definitely want to spend more more time playing uh, with it. Uh, the first thing I've done is uh, download all those old books that uh, I used uh, back in the days uh, to learn about the processor and so. And uh, I downloaded uh, a French book uh, that was uh, written by uh, Dominique Delay and uh, some of his friends that uh, was called the uh, uh, Le, Le Deux GS Épluché. And that was... Uh, a great uh, book. It's only in French, unfortunately. And uh, at the beginning, they, they explained that they worked on uh, for four months, uh, I guess, during the summer vacations on that book. And um, I started reading it, and it has two great chapters on graphics and uh, sounds. The other ones are not so great, but uh, but uh, I've... I've I've looked at the book and I've seen that it's a really uh, it requires some work to uh, to polish it. So I've uh, I've taken the uh, the book and I've uh, extracted all the uh, the text. I've OCR'd it and I'm uh, cleaning it up and adding graphics and uh, making it beautiful and uh, correcting all the uh, spelling and uh, factual mistakes that are still in that book. And uh, I've, uh, I've, I'm all, all, almost done. I've uh, fixed five out of six chapters. So uh, 
I think I will uh, release that uh, new edition, second edition, 30 years later, uh, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> nice. Uh, wow, that's incredible. And hopefully that's after incredible. that I will... No, hopefully after that I will uh, I, I will try to uh, to add a couple of chapters because uh, I think that no one's going to understand the Apple IIGS if they don't understand how the uh, how the monitor works. But uh, I think uh, we shouldn't lose all the, all that knowledge. I mean, there are very interesting uh, products that were written on the Apple IIGS. So I also bought the source code to the all the. Uh, Orca products, so Orca M and Orca C and so on. I want to take a look at uh, how they wrote all all those uh, products because they were extremely efficient. They use very little memory. And uh, if you compare them to what we have today, it's actually quite similar, but much more efficient. So I want to learn how they did that. Wow, that's that's really terrific news uh, that you're restoring uh, to GSA Pluche because that yeah that book is a is a legend. It was uh, sort of a sort of an underground book, if anything, because it was uh, really really hard to find if you are outside of France. And uh, uh, it was a book that I had heard of, but was never able to to find basically until the early 2000s. Was I think was the first time I laid eyes on it. But uh, it was this sort of uh, legendary tome of how to get, you know, the sort of full screen scrolling and so on that, uh, that, uh, the French yeah. uh, games did. And, uh, you know, all the, uh, secret techniques of, uh, you know, locating the stack and the graphics page and all that sort of thing that, uh, I guess today we, we know from. The, the graphics chapter is, uh, is quite good. And, uh, so is the sound chapter. I mean, both are, are really worth, uh, uh, understanding because it gives you a good idea of what can be achieved with uh, with a processor. And uh, if someone uh, listens to uh, this podcast and is willing to help translating it uh, into English, well, I will be more than happy to send the uh, the document uh, so that they can work on it. Any chance that uh, your your work with these books might inspire you to create a new product? The, the the reason I'm trying to uh, to get back uh, to to learning uh, how the Apple IIGS worked was because I'm I've always been interested in uh, in education, and uh, I've been uh, working mostly on enterprise products. I work at IBM right now as a chief architect, and uh, so there's not much education going on there, and uh, the projects aren't as fun as. Uh, the ones I uh, I had when I worked on the on the 2GS. So uh, uh, I would like to go back to education and be able to write some uh, interactive books. So uh, I like what uh, Apple has done with the uh, with the iBooks, but I would like to uh, to build books that are more interactive, so that uh, you can ha- you could have an emulator within the book, and that can be done if you use JavaScript, but it's probably not very efficient. So I want to have a book of my own that I could use to build that project on uh, on an iPad. So I'm trying to work on the content, understand uh, what I, exactly I would like to do. And so that will probably be uh, my next project, build that interactive book with a built-in uh, uh, chip emulator and uh, not a full 2GS emulator because that will be rejected by uh, Apple uh, immediately. <laughs> but uh, but I, I would like to do something like that because I think that uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in education. And right now it seems like uh, when you discuss uh, education, it's all about watching videos. And uh, I don't think that's the answer. I mean, it's it's probably a partial answer. But you still need to study, and that's best done with a book, by reading. And then you need to be able to uh, do some uh, exercises. And that requires uh, the interactive uh, section. So I will I will spend some time working on that project. Great. And it will, and and I hope my first book is about uh, the two GS. <laughs> Excellent, I hope so too. Now we just need to uh, get you up here for Kansas Fest. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, uh, I don't have a lot of uh, vacation right now, but uh, 
Believe me, I've been uh, watching uh, the announcements and uh, I, I would love to, uh, to meet the editor of Nibble. Uh, I've recently also bought all the, uh, the issues of that magazine. It's something that uh, I grew up uh, reading and uh, I would certainly like to hear all those uh, stories uh, behind the magazine. Excellent. Well, yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> can, if you can't get yeah, away this year, year, maybe yeah. next year. <laughs> well, and, and these days uh, they've been they've been pretty good about recording the sessions and putting them up online. Um, some some point after the after the festivities are over. So even if you don't make it to Kansas Fest, you can probably catch the keynote online at some point. Well, that would be great. Well, uh, Quinn, do you have any other questions? Uh, nope, that's all I had. Okay. Well, um, I think that's what I have as well. Uh, Hybert, thank you very much for joining us. It was great to hear about the origins of, of, um, of SoundSmith and, and your games and to catch up with you a little bit. Well, it was great spending uh, some time talking about the Apple II and the Apple IIGS. And I have very fond memories of the, those times. I really enjoy your podcast. Uh-huh. Keep up with the good work. And I hope you have uh, some interesting uh, guests in the future, like uh, Bill Budge. Uh, it was a lot of fun hearing uh, uh, how he developed uh, his products. So uh, I'm looking forward uh, for the next episode. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Hey, this is Sheppy, and you are listening to Open Apple. Enjoy. All right. Uh, that was great. Thank you again, Hybert. That's right. It's pronounced Hybert. That uh, took some time for us to get there. Um, I'm sure some of that back and forth will end up in, in the blooper reel, but um, <laughs> uh, great stories in Soundsmith, man. What a great program. It, like he said, I think it really revolutionized, you know, the, the 2GS and, and the way users and users use could, you know, deal with uh, the music output. You had this machine with that in Sonic chip that made some great noise and no way to use it until Soundsmith. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned this a bit during the interview, but I, I mean, I can't, I can't stress enough how what a seminal, seminal program that SoundSmith was for the 2GS. I mean, the 2GS might not have been nearly what it was community-wise without that program to show people, hey, here's what this thing, can, here's what this machine is really capable of, and right. uh, you know, the the level of polish that it had, and just it was such a, it was just a fun program to use. It was one of those things that you fired up to show your friends, and it had the awesome, you know, title screen and the cool. The amazing UI of, you know, playing the song with the notes streaming by and the VU meters. And, uh, yeah, it was just such a, a fantastic uh, showpiece for the platform, I think, uh, at a time, you know, where it was really needed. Yeah, especially since it was getting basically zero support from Apple. So, I mean, they kind of pushed it into the educational market and like, oh, let's forget about it and wash our hands. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, like Hybert said, that it was... It was, you know, we needed it for the bragging rights, you know, it's sort of like us, <laughs> yeah. the, the ner- us nerdy fans knew deep down that the 2GS was capable of, of much more than the Amiga in many areas. And uh, so we needed something to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, let's talk some news. Yeah, let's do that. It may be old, but there's still news. Apple II news. What have we got, Quinn? Uh, let's see. Well, it looks like the first thing we've got is a new mocking board uh, for an unexpected uh, machine. Uh, I think there are many of us who might have dreamed of putting a mocking board in our 2C, uh, but never thought that might actually happen. Well, uh, Ian King, Ian Kim, uh, my apologies, from Korea uh, has made that happen. We've talked about Ian's uh, interesting products before, but this is, uh, this is a really exciting one because it's something that... Uh, uh, no one else is quite doing yet, so uh, this is really cool. It, uh, it's a Mockingboard clone, and uh, it plugs into the internal expansion slot on your 2C. So we will link to that. It's uh, it's not quite shipping yet, I, as far as I could tell. I just checked his site again. Did yeah, I think different? he's I think he's selling them on on eBay. Oh, okay, okay. We'll try and find a link to that. Uh, and yeah, one catch with this is that it is uh, 2C only, so it is apparently not compatible with the 2C+. Plus. Uh, oh, uh, boo, some... boo. <laughs> yeah, but he's got some great demos of it uh, on his site. I think he mentioned, uh, possibly in the Facebook group, I'm not sure, I think he mentioned that he was 
going to be adding to C++ support, but I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, uh, it's uh, yeah, there's some demos on the site, and it uh, looks like it works really, really well. Yeah, now, wasn't there originally like an external Mockingboard unit that sort of uh, big wall wart thing that hung off the back of your TC? Yeah, I think there was. I think the original Mockingboard, there was, it was like the 4D or something, or 4C, maybe, I forget what it was called. But yeah, there was a model of it that w ran through the serial port, I think. Uh, but I, I've never seen one. <laughs> I've only sort of heard of it. Uh, okay. And I think it needed... I think it needed different support, like Mockingboard software wouldn't work out of the box. Uh, with oh, it. So you useful. Your Ultima, Ultima, yeah, like your Ultima, fired up Ultima 4 with this one, because, you know, it ran through the serial port, so it needed a completely different uh, way to program it to it. So, uh, so software had to recognize it. Gotcha. Okay. So, yeah, he is selling them on uh, eBay right now. Uh, the seller seller's name, and we'll have links in the show notes, but it's KSD as in Delta 9 and he's got um, the current batch, three available, seven sold. They're $99 a piece. Awesome. Okay. Buy it now. Yeah. Looks like a fun thing. I guess the only thing it doesn't have is the slots for the speech chips, which, uh, you know, the marking boards normally have. But my understanding is that those the actual speech chips are fairly unobtainium anyway. So having the slots there that are going to sit empty is probably not a big loss. Yeah. And I, I think the number of titles that actually did speech synthesis through the marking board was a tiny, tiny subset of the software that supported the Mockingboard in the first place, which wasn't much. So yeah, I don't know sure, that you're yeah. missing a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, we we're lucky to have games that supported it at all, never mind all of the different modes it had. Uh, all right, well, moving right along, we've got some exciting, very exciting new stuff from the Lawless Legends team, uh, the uh, officially favorite product of the Open Apple podcast. <laughs> I think I can speak for both of us there. Uh, they've got a yeah. uh, new gameplay video, and uh, it, uh, it looks fantastic. Have you watched this, Mike? I have, yeah. It's on YouTube right now. This was posted on um, March 4th, so like right around the time I think we posted our last uh, podcast. It's been up for a little while, uh, and um, to to borrow a, a Steve Jobs ism, it's lickable. <laughs> it is indeed. Yes, to uh, to to borrow a, a Trip Hawkins ism, it's uh, simple hot. And <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I know we're just quoting CEOs now. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is very exciting uh, new video, and uh, this game continues to amaze. Uh, you know, you look at at what this team is doing uh, on you know, bone stock hardware compared to what games, you know, did at the time. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I just can't get over how good this game looks and how good it plays. Yep. Gimme, gimme, gimme. I want it now. <laughs> That's right. Well, when you finally get Lawless Legends, you might want to play it on an emulator and it looks like there's one new option Smooth, in Gwen. that field. This, <laughs> you like that? I went to Segway <laughs> school. Uh, this one, uh, this one kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, it's called AI PC, uh, Apple in PC 2E emulator. So it's a 2E emulator and it looks like it does uh, Mockingboard and Phaser and a bunch of other stuff. So it looks pretty impressive. Uh, how did you find this one, Mike? Um, I, I think it showed up in one of my Google uh, news alerts for Apple II stuff. This uh, is Apple II E only. So if you're looking for a more general Apple II emulator, I'm not sure that, uh, I, I don't know what you would lose by only having Apple II E unless you were looking for something specific in like uh, Apple II plus, uh, emulation, I guess it's uh, open source GPL. It's free and, uh, it's currently at 0 0.1.38.2. And sadly it is windows only. Boo, boo. Yeah. Yeah, boo for that. But uh, open source is fantastic. I mean, yeah, if you've ever wanted to write an Apple II emulator, I mean, what better resource yeah. than the source code for an Apple II emulator? Uh, and I have to say, you know, usually you, we see a lot of these kind of, um, I don't want to say also ran emulators because that sounds mean, but uh, these sort of uh, sort of side project emulators uh, that come and go. And they're usually, you know, they do most of a two plus or something, and then the developers move on to other things or whatever. But uh, this thing is actually really, really complete uh, to the point of like competing almost with virtual two, you know, it's, it's not doing the image writer support and some of that, but you know, the hardware support's really impressive, all of the sound cards and everything. Uh, so it's surprisingly far along for, for having come kind of out of nowhere. Um, so I would uh, definitely recommend people check this out. No, I Typically for Windows, Apple Win has been the emulator of choice for many, many years now. There have been, as you mentioned, others that, you know, bubble up to the top and then rot away, uh, ignored by their programmers. But 
Applewin has been around and in development for, um, I guess, almost two decades now. Wow, that's weird to say that. But um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what motivated. Like, why would you go out of your way to write another one? But uh, you know, hey, the more the merrier. This thing looks great. So if you, if for whatever reason you don't like Applewin, uh, definitely check this out. Yeah, yeah, I had that same thought actually. I was like, I don't think I would sit down and write an Apple II emulator today because, yeah on both plat- major platforms, you've got Apple Win and Virtual 2 on PC and Mac, and they're both so good that uh, uh, I wouldn't want to try to compete with it. But uh, having said that, uh, one thing that really impressed me about the demos of this is that it seems to do all of the timing right on, uh, because the French Touch demos, you know, Crazy Cycles yeah. and Scroll, 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 and so on, work correctly on it. So I'm not sure if every emulator can claim that. Hmm. Uh, so that that's pretty impressive, because... You know, uh, French Touch folks pride themselves on breaking emulators, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's cool to see that this one seems to run them. Uh, I guess uh, they have a benchmark now to uh, to test against uh, for extreme hardware tricks. <laughs> All right, well, a friend of the show, uh, David Grealish, is in the news here. Uh, tell us what's going on here, Mike. Yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Mr. Grealish, who I think he he was the co he was the founder or co-founder of uh, um, those rats over at. Uh, the Retro Computing Roundtable. He has uh, since moved on as a full-time host, but I know he shows up every now and then. Uh, before that, he had done a series of um, um, periodicals called Historically Brewed. I think it was started out as the newsletter of March, the Mid-Atlantic Retro Computer Historical Society. Oh, I blew it, I think. Almost got it. But um, and, and those were uh, out of print for a while, and then he did a uh, Kickstarter to, to get them reprinted, and we had him on the show to interview him about that. And uh, I, uh, I got those. That was a, a really great thing. And now the, the PDF that he created um, to make that possible is a free download uh, from his Dropbox. So thank you, David, very much for making that available. And also, on a personal note, congratulations on your new job as historian. Uh, at the soon-to-open Computer Museum of America. I know for a while there he was um, a bit frustrated over some things in his life and made some – and it looks like he's uh, made some changes, and, and um, I hope he's happy doing that because it looks like some really great stuff happening over there. I want to go to that museum. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And uh, I also look forward to us torpedoing his Dropbox when this show goes live. Darn right. <laughs> All six of you. That's right. It's surprising. Well, it's surprisingly easy to bring a personal Dropbox to its knees when uh, when shown publicly. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's Especially true. when downloading a PDF. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, well, speaking of friends of the show, uh, retro retro bright master Javier Rivera uh, is has been hacking on his Franklin Ace five hundred. And uh, I really love this. Uh, for anyone who was not uh, at Kansas Fest this uh, last year, there was a Franklin Ace 500 on the table, and uh, it was very popular. And I almost grabbed it myself, but uh, <laughs> see our aforementioned conversation re-junk piling up. But uh, uh, yeah, the Franklin Ace 500 is a really, really cool little machine. And, yeah, uh, so Javier, uh, Javier had one with a bad power supply. And I absolutely love his solution. It turns out the power supply from a 2C Plus uh, fits inside a Franklin Ace 500. The, the Ace originally had uh, a brick on a leash the, uh, like the original 2C did, but apparently there's a big em- empty space inside the case. <laughs> uh, so perhaps they were planning to do an internal power supply and didn't, possibly for FCC reasons or size reasons or, Lawsuit what, or reasons. what have you. Yeah, lawsuit reasons. Uh, maybe they realized they wanted to sh- distribute it in more countries, and so they needed the flexibility of an external brick, whatever. But uh, in any case, there's a big empty space in there, and it turns out if you turn the 2C plus power supply upside down, it fits in that space. So uh, he did that, and you know he has a really slick internally powered uh, Franklin Ace 500. So I'm very jealous of Javier right now. <laughs> Javier, come on our show. We want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and bring that bad boy to to mm. It's really cool. Yep. Uh, so yeah, if you for you know for those of us who have two C plus power supplies just lying around in piles, you know, here's here's a way to <laughs> use them up. <laughs> Free some space in your loft and uh, throw them away. <laughs> yeah, that was the funniest part of his write up for me was he's like, well, I had this extra two C plus power supply, and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> who has extra two C plus power supplies right. lying around? <laughs> anyway, uh, funny stories. Okay. Mm. Mm. Um, moving along Uh, it's funny how every time Oregon Trail is in the news we are sort of obligated to talk about it here even though sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with the Apple II Uh, 
Uh, and in fact, this article opens with anyone who grew up <laughs> with a Macintosh in, your, in their school, which made me punch my screen, and Boom. now I need a new screen. Boom. So thanks a lot, <laughs> author of this article. It does uh, mention the Apple II in the third paragraph, so. It does, yeah. And there's, uh, did you watch the video of this? I did, yeah. It's funny. Yeah, so there is there is a, a very sad beat up Apple II in the video. Uh, it's actually missing a key and it has mismatched disk drives and it's a very sad looking thing. But uh, it is actually kind of a cute video. Uh, he, uh, this uh, writer for Vox, I guess, actually did some research on what the Oregon Trail was actually like and sort of related it to uh, to the Oregon Trail, the game. So, eh, you know, if you have seven and a half minutes to kill, it's mildly amusing. Yeah, it's basically the R-rated Oregon Trail. So, uh, and and not in a good way, not a good kind of R rating, but but the sad dysentery and that sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I should say when I saw the the headline, I was like, oh, no, this is just going to be juvenile. <laughs> you know, they added a bunch of, you know, adult content. <laughs> naked to, naked to skins. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but actually, they actually, it's much more interesting than that. So give them credit. Yeah, I, I, words, I, that's part, partly my fault. I, I put in our, our spreadsheet that Oregon Trail got, get, gets a naughty makeover. <laughs> That's right. You had preconditioned me to expect the worst of this, of this article. <laughs> well, it's me. You always expect the worst with me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, worth worth a watch if you have a few minutes to go. Sure. Uh, all right, moving right along. Uh, well, I guess this one, this must be yours, Mike. Uh, not mine, but you made a hack a day again <laughs> for your decelerating the Apple Two C Plus article. Not to slag on hack a day too much, but let's start off with what they got wrong, Quinn. Anything? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't put this in the news because I'm tired of talking about myself. Um, that's, a, that's a lie. I love talking about myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're not fooling anyone. It's, yeah. Nobody who does a podcast does not like the sound of that. <laughs> um, let's see. You said that they got some stuff wrong. I'm actually just glancing at the article right now because I'm not sure. Oh, you haven't read it. Okay. No, I was mostly just kidding because um, we, we had talked recently about your um, – your, 2GS video and all the information they got wrong in that. So and I don't think that was Hackaday in particular, but I, I figured there was at least something we could pick on them for. But no, I, my hopes are dashed. <laughs> Way to go, Hackaday. Yeah, think, Good for you. Yeah, yeah, they did okay, I think. Uh, uh, what is funny about anytime Apple II stuff makes the mainstream media is it inevitably generates uh, comment threads filled with, I had an Apple II. It was great sorts of things because there's always a large segment of people out there that had an Apple II or used an Apple II and had no, have no idea there's people still doing this stuff. So they're always uh, happy to jump in and uh, uh, save. Uh, well, uh, speaking of the, the internet, I guess, uh, <laughs> my, I said I went to Segway school. I didn't say I got an A. Um, our friend of the show, 4 a.m., uh, went, uh, went viral himself, um, much as your co-host did recently. So uh, I will try and dig out the links to this. Unfortunately, being a monthly show, this happened quite a while ago, and uh, I've since misplaced the links. But uh, uh, did you see this happen, Mike? There was um, a whole bunch of news outlets picked up what 4AM is doing. Yeah, I did. I the, My first inkling, inkling that anything was happening, I follow uh, 4AM on Twitter, and if you don't, you should be as well. Uh, but he posted something about like shutting down his, his social media because it was, <laughs> yeah. it was melting down. So, and yeah, all you got to do is uh, Google 4AM internet archive and it's, it's all over the place. This is the, you know, he's been uploading programs for quite some time to the internet archive and I guess they hit 500 and that was a magic milestone number or something. I don't, I don't know what triggers it, you know? Um, but yeah, everybody picked up on this. Most of them got, you know, like we were just talking about details and incorrect. And apparently some people think 4AM is a person. Some people think it's a, a team of hackers, uh, whatever. Go to Internet Archive. You can play all of the titles that he's cracked that we've been talking about for months. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny watching uh, the sort of greater public interpret what 4AM has been doing for those of us who have been in touch <laughs> yeah. for such a long time with, with what he's doing. But uh uh, yeah, I, I heard someone suggest that it was a Dread Pirate Robert situation where maybe <laughs> where it was just – it was multiple people and just using all the same name, uh, which I thought was a funny idea. Yeah, but, so it's, uh, it's interesting looking at the Google thing right now. And, and Jason Scott actually uh, posted about this on his blog, his ASCII blog back in May of 2015 about all these titles. So this is – you know, sometimes it takes the media a while to catch up. And by then, we've already moved on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And this one went uh, fairly impressively viral. Uh, yeah. It hit Venture Beat and Wired. a lot of like really mainstream stuff. Yeah, Wired. Yeah, like really mainstream Time stuff. Magazine so much. I got it. So yeah, yeah big yeah. deal. 
Congrats, yeah, 4AM. Sure. Come on our show. Yeah. Jerk. <laughs> yeah. We promised to put a shadowy lightning on you. <laughs> That's right. Uh, which, you know, is funny because it's radio. You know, just in case anyone did, didn't get that. Jokes are funnier when you explain them, right? Oh, that, of course. That's how yes. it works. And then continue okay. to explain them. <laughs> Wait. Oh, okay. So I should keep going. You should. Saying. <laughs> okay. Good. No. Uh, all right. Moving right along. Um, let's see. Uh, our good friends... Uh, our good friends Henry Corbis and Anthony Martino are uh, in the news with uh, their 3.5 drive controller. Uh, they're calling it A2 Disc Controller, and it's a clone of the uh, Apple 3.5 drive controller. Uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, beast, this thing. It, um, it allows 800K and 1.44 megabyte floppy drives to be connected to your 3.5 inch, obviously, to your 2E and 2GS, and it's... You know, it's a, it's not it's not like a Unidisc card, but it allows sort of certain three and a half inch drives to be connected, but it doesn't allow like say daisy chaining with your five and a quarter inch drives. So it's kind of an interesting middle ground between you know the port on the two GS and and uh, uh, other options. Um, but what's just uh, what's really cool about it is it also allows the use of the Applied Engineering one point six megabyte drive if you happen to have one of those. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure the Interface cards for those things are unobtainium. So if you happen to have one of those, this is a great solution for getting it up and running again. Yeah. So this is, I think, a, a clone of the card that's basically, you know, um, been unobtainium. You know, it sells for, on eBay for hundreds of dollars when you see it. Um, and you can, well, <laughs> I'm looking, I'm at their, uh, the ultimate apple com store right now and it's sold out. Hopefully they'll have more soon, but, uh, it was selling for one forty nine ninety nine, which is quite a bit less than, than, uh, what they were asking for at the, in the usual places. Um, now I, uh, for a while I lusted after, uh, one of these three and a half inch controllers that could do the 1.4 meg floppy, uh, stuff. But I, I found that, you know, with the proliferation of awesome SD storage options for the Apple II. I just don't need it that much. Um, you know, occasionally I'll find an old uh, one meg floppy that I created with one of these cards and I'll transfer, use it to transfer the information over. But for the most part, um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, it's great to see this and, and I'm glad that I'm not panicking over, you know, I got to pay 800 bucks for this card because it's, I won't see it again for eight years or something like that. But <laughs> I think a lot of the usefulness kind of, um, well, I shouldn't, I'm going to edit all that out because we want them, we want people to buy their products, not avoid them. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. I think where this uh, might really have a niche is if you've got, you know, a lot of, uh, three and a half inch drive, uh, floppies, uh, that you want to preserve, you know, if you've got eight bit stuff on three and a half inch discs in your closet and you don't have a two GS, for example, it might be quite difficult to get that data off of them. Uh, especially if, you know, if you're one of the few people who had a 1.44 uh, megabyte drive back in the day, or heaven help you, if you had a 1.6 megabyte AE drive, uh, you know, that data would be locked on there forever. Like there would be just no way to get that off. Cause as you said, the eBay cards are, are on obtainium. So, uh, yeah, I think this could really have a niche there. And, uh, I think it's also just cool if you wanted to have a, you know, really maxed out, you know, 2E, if you wanted to have the 2E that you could never afford back in the day, this would be kind of the ultimate, uh, a cherry on that Sunday to be able to have a stack of three and a half inch drives on it as well. So, uh, yeah, fun product. Now we just need someone to adapt it to the two C plus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I wonder if, are there any of the solid state devices that will do like 1.44 megabyte disc images or 1.6? I, I don't know. I don't know about the, well, as I understand it, the 1.6 drive is actually a 1.4 meg with a, a hacked up driver. That's how they got that extra mm, K. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, Tony was telling me about that at Kansas Fest. Um, but you could, yeah, w- without a card like this, you could potentially end up in a situation because I, I think the, does, does the, What's the the floppy EMU? Does that one do the three and a half inch HD drive discs? Uh, I don't believe. So. Well, well. So hold on. Uh, yeah. So the floppy EMU Model B does do the th- does do eight hundred K three three and a half. Okay. Um, but not but the I high density. I don't believe it does. Yeah, I don't believe it does the one point four four. Okay. So so in other words, no. There's <clears throat> there's no nothing emulating it right now. So if you have data on there. I, I don't know. If it were me, I'd move it off and, and uh, you know, put it in a frame on, on your wall and move your data over to an SD solution. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you've got any of these disks, buy one of these cards 
right the heck now and get the data off of them because, uh, yeah, if, uh, if Ultimate Micro ever stops making these cards, which I'm sure they will someday, uh, you, you will never, ever get that data off because, you know, those cards just don't exist anymore. Yeah, so it does, the, the floppy EMU does do the 1.4 meg Macintosh disks, but not Apple II. Mm, right, that makes sense. Okay. But of course, that doesn't help you if you have the actual floppies and you're trying right. to preserve them. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Uh, this kind of a funny video uh, popped up in my feed uh, from uh, Vintage is the New Old, which is a site that many of our listeners probably know. Uh, one of the contributors there, Paolo Garcia, did a kind of a cool video, uh, which he's calling uh, Apple's Biggest Mistake. And uh, it's a comparison of the uh, Apple IIgs and the uh, 128K original Mac. And, you know, he says a lot of stuff that we all knew back in the day, those of us who were 2GS heads. But uh, he, uh, yeah, he lays it all out kind of uh, tuned to modern audiences. And, uh, you know, he's done his homework. Uh, I think his analysis is quite fair and, and quite reasonable. And, uh, you know, the video is nicely produced. So it's kind of a kind of a fun watch. I, uh, I recommend it. He obviously, you know, he goes into how the graphics and sound and so on, uh, how they compare. And he manages to steer clear of most of the conspiracy theories about Apple having slowed it down intentionally right. and yada yada. <laughs> but uh, uh, so yeah, it's just kind of a, it's a, it's a nice, fairly objective look at, uh, at the two platforms and uh, you know, what, what a difference the support of the company makes, you know, in terms of success or failure of a product. Uh, you know, there's no question the 2GS was technically superior in virtually every way. So it was just a question of which platform the company was supporting basically dictated what succeeded and what failed. So uh, it's a good watch. Uh, what might have been. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, who knows? Maybe there would have been an Apple 3GS someday that had an Apple 3, uh, a Mega 3 chip in it that had like the 2GS and the Apple 3 and everything all in one chip. So it was backwards. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> that was the nerdiest possible Apple 2 joke, by the way. <laughs> I, I referenced the Mega 2 chip, which, you know. And again, explaining makes it funnier. <laughs> right i think that one needed explaining i don't know it wasn't it, and it's still not funny i'm not making it better am i i'm gonna stop talking now <laughs> oh we got it it's just not uh, funny like, oh, all right <laughs> shut me up and talk about jimmy mark <laughs> all right uh our favorite um games historian well i don't know if it's our favorite because we liked uh we liked um i can't even remember her name obviously we like her that much uh, we like lane a lot when she was on the show uh but jimmy uh does a lot of really great writing about uh, games, companies, people that were uh, in the in the computer industry at the time, and he's done this uh, three part series on, uh, that he calls "Opening the Gold Box." And he goes in depth uh, with uh, SSI's Gold Box uh, Dungeons and Dragons games, especially. And of course, you can't really just talk about that line without talking about the history of SSI and the war games and stuff as well. So. In addition to being a great piece on those titles, it's a great history of SSI. If you if you haven't um, if you haven't read up on SSI, or probably even if you have, there's some great stuff in here that you know I know I didn't know. So, um, and I just I'm forever grateful that he uh, Jimmy isn't smart enough to realize he could put this in a book and sell it. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that's where this is headed ultimately once he gets up to I don't know 1992 or something. <laughs> decided he's done, but. Uh, uh, yeah, this is a great series of articles for sure. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap uh, between retro computing fans and fans of, of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and uh, from back in the day. So there's a lot of, you know, in the in the build up articles to to Pool of Radiance and the other Gold Box games. There's a lot of uh, history uh, about the dynamic between SSI and and TSR and getting the D and D license and you know what a uh, what a jerk Gary Gygax is and all this sort of thing. It's it's very entertaining reading. And uh, so I definitely recommend that. Uh, you know, the Pool of Radiance was a, a really, it was a big deal at the time. I remember, I remember oh, being yeah. very, very excited uh, when that game was, was getting passed around as, as legit uh, offsite backups in our junior high school. And, uh, you know, it was just to, to, to play the the, the real, you know, Dungeons and Dragons game, you know, Bard's Tale and Ultima and stuff were, are, are great as for what they were, but it's sort of uh, a real D&D game was kind of the holy grail to have the actual game rules, you know, in our favorite medium of computer games uh, was was pretty exciting. So, uh, and, you know, they're really terrific games. The combat engine in them is just legendary. It was so well done. Uh, even even with the sort of the Dungeons and Dragons rules being what they are, uh, <laughs> what I love about Jimmy's take is that he's he's honest about the fact that 
you know, Dungeons and Dragons is a pretty terrible game design. Uh, it's it's a set of massive rule books that make very little sense to anyone. Uh, there's a famous quote in there from one of Gary Gygax's colleagues where he says, how many pole arms did you really need, Gary? <laughs> and, uh, you know, anyone who's sort of played or you know, read those books know, know, gets that joke. But uh, uh, so he, Jimmy talks a lot about that and how Pool of Radiance managed to make a great game kind of in spite of the <laughs> terrible Dungeons and Dragons rules. So they they pick and choose certain pieces uh, to make it less onerous. And uh, they they kind of pick the stuff that a computer is really good at, you know, doing all the bookkeeping and stuff for you and, uh, you know, leaving more of the tactical decisions up to the player. So it's a, it's a great write-up. Yeah, when SSI announced the series, um, you know, they did a great job of hyping it up. And fortunately, the games lived up to the hype. But I, I remember like, people like, especially uh, role-playing game fans and, and D&D fans lost their minds. My, my D&D friends <laughs> were, you know, uh, scouring magazines for, for articles and previews and ads. And uh, when, you know, even the, even the bigger press magazines at the time were, were – salivating to to play these games so fortunately it, it all worked out really well and and jimmy does an excellent job of uh, chronicling the whole thing mm, definitely yeah just sort of a personal memory too about pool of radiance as much as i loved it it was actually one of my earliest memories of starting to feel bad about my 8-bit apple II because <laughs> it came along fairly late in the run and it was one of those it was a major game that came out virtually simultaneously on you know a lot of platforms and so it was really becoming clear uh, that the, you know, the 8-bit Apple II's graphics were well past its prime, and uh, it was really starting to show. So it's a it's a great game for what it is, but uh, you know, visually you compare it to the you know we're, its contemporaries were of course the Commodore 64, you know, the first gen Amiga, the you know PC with EGA. So you know the 8-bit Apple II just really wasn't in the same league anymore. Uh, so it was. Yeah, so sort of the cracks were definitely showing, but uh, it's a, it's really a wonderful game for sure. And SSI definitely realized that. You know, they I, I think they they released a a handful of titles, but certainly nowhere near the entire span of the Gold Box games on the Apple II platform. And as disappointed as I was not to see those, it, it made sense because you know, like you said, it was just kind of embarrassing. Although not nearly as embarrassing as the scan that he's posted from. It's an SSI inner office memo. Uh, from a Susan B, um, basically advising that uh, the programmers need to shower, add deodorant, and dress in clean clothes. Um, <laughs> yes. Because uh, the, she says our quarters are close, the windows don't open, and it's beginning to smell ripe in here. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, I think they call that the uh, the infamous hygiene memo. Uh, it's a yeah. Uh, Jimmy's got a great great scan of that in his articles. Yeah, I think uh, I think Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds, the second one, were the only two that came out on the app on the 8-bit Apple IIs. I'm not certain about that, but uh Yeah, it wasn't many. Uh, yeah, after that. Yeah, after that the PC was, you know, into well into EGA and even early VGA stuff and the Amiga was mature by then and uh, so yeah, the the 8-bit Apple II was pretty much done at that point. Yep. All right, well, let's shift gears and talk uh, VCF. We've got some upcoming shows, is that right? Yeah, uh, so VCF uh, reorganized itself into da, 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 VCF. It used to be the uh, Vintage <laughs> Computing Festivals, and now it is the Vintage Computer Federations. Uh, and I think oh. um, I think it's, you know, um, an attempt to reorganize um, the, the guy that, Originally organized VCF way back in like the late 90s, Salam Ismail had some personal problems with his collection recently and ended up in an ugly lawsuit. And I, I think there was some pushback and frustration about things not going forward and sort of, you know, organizing uh, committees and stuff. And so they decided to, to strike out on their own. And uh, so the um, VCF Southeast is actually happening right now as we are recording this. Looking forward to seeing some pictures of that. Uh, VCF East will be uh, April 15th through the 17th in uh, central New Jersey. VCF West is finally returning. That's the original one in Silicon Valley that happened like once or twice and hasn't happened since. That's uh, August 6th and 7th, and VCF Midwest is back in Chicago on uh, September 10th and 11th, 11th. So if you want to see a VCF, you have plenty of opportunities. Yeah, it's so great to see VCF West finally back. It was such an anomaly for so many years that you could go see vintage computers in whatever New Jersey or wherever it was, but not in Silicon Valley. That was so strange to me. Or not in, not in California anywhere. Well, it's very smart of them to choose a new name that has the same acronym because of course everybody calls it VCF. So right, exactly. That, yeah. That that mental muscle memory will uh, persist, which is smart. 
All right, well, circling back again to Ultimate Micro uh, and A2 Heaven, uh, the uh, the mad Bulgarian who uh, we like to talk very much about. Uh, they both have 2GS ROM adapters. These are pretty cool things. Uh, tell us what uh, these might be used for, Mike. Well, I think there's going to be fist fights at Kansas Fest uh, between the, the Ultimate Micro guys and the A2 Heaven guy, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, So Ultimate Micro announced their ROM adapter. They have... Um, one that goes from ROM 0 to ROM 1. I don't think there's, um, let's see, uh, I'm reading from A2 Central here. Uh, this is the version 2 of one that they had released earlier uh, where he used he used to machine pin. Okay, so I, I Henry says, I used, I used to machine pin sockets stacked together to allow the use of a standard ROM in the 2GS. There was a hidden benefit to these new adapters uh, since they use a standard uh, EEPROM users can now do firmware development for the 2GS very simply. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, he co- he continues, for ROM 3 firmware development or ROM replacement, you will require two adapters since there are two ROMs on the ROM 3 motherboard. And there's his uh, 30 bucks. And the A2 Heaven adapter is $35. And this will let you switch your original Apple 2GS between ROM 1, uh, ROM 0 and ROM 1. Uh, or even more interestingly, he says, between the Beta 2 and uh, 2BF ROMs, if you're curious about those. Um, A2 Heaven's version features a color-changing LED to indicate which ROM is active. Uh, obviously, due to architecture differences, you can't use ROM 3 or the... You can't use this in a ROM 3 or a Mark Twain Apple 2GS. So uh, if you want to mess around with your ROM 3, you're going to have to go with Ultimate Micro. Yeah, uh, that it sounded like Ultimate Micro would go all the way up to ROM three. You just needed two of them. Comments does not. If that's true, yeah, you need two of them. That's right. Yeah, yeah, these are pretty cool. Uh, upgrading a ROM zero to GS was always sort of thought to be impossible. So it's neat that uh, there's now a fairly straightforward way to do that. Almost as impossible as Quinn getting her two GS out of the basement. <laughs> one of these days. <laughs> one of these days. I guess. Uh, I guess we should explain for anyone who doesn't know the different two GS major ROM versions were 0, 1, and 3. And uh, the ROM 0 was, you know, the very, very first 2GS version. And it didn't really, uh, it had a lot of bugs and it had some fairly significant issues and not a lot of software runs on it. So it's kind of a curiosity, but not a very desirable machine. Uh, And then the ROM 1 machine uh, was kind of, it was the standard for a long time. So basically all software runs on that. In fact, uh, if you ask FTA and similar groups, they'll tell you the ROM 1 is the more desirable one. Uh, and then uh, the ROM 3 was kind of, uh, it was an update where they moved a lot of the system software, the toolboxes and so on that had to be loaded on the ROM 1. They moved that into ROM and they fixed a bunch of bugs and stuff in the 2GS ROM. So there's much more of the operating system and, and SDKs and so on are in ROM on the ROM 3. So, uh, it, you know, it boots faster and, and uh, has a bunch of bug fixes. So it breaks some games. it's debatable nowadays. Yeah, it does break some games and some demos that don't run on the ROM 3. So it's kind of debatable, which is better, honestly. I guess it depends what you're going to use it for. But uh, yeah, ROM 1 and 3 are kind of the two major competing versions. Yeah, I think the only reason that you would want a ROM 0 uh, was that the first 50,000, I think, were the ones that had the the WAS limited edition case top. Um, and so those tend to, to go for some money. Uh, although, uh, you know, it, it's easy these days if you have one of those to to put the case top on any 2GS you want to use. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there was also, um, you know, they mentioned the, the beta ROMs. There are a few machines out there that, that I guess slipped out from, from Apple that have uh, interim ROMs in them. I, I don't, I know they've been dumped. I haven't really followed the threads on those to see if there were any major differences. I do have one of those machines that has beta ROMs in it. I found it in a, a thrift store here in Denver, weirdly. So I, I don't know if uh, there may be a lot of them out there. I don't, I don't really know. And then there's of course the Mark Twain machines and there's only a few of those and those are um, pretty radically different for, than, than what you, uh, what you get with the earlier machines. Yeah. Those are sometimes called the ROM 4 2GS. Yep. Uh, but of course, yeah, it's much more than a ROM difference there. The, they have, uh, if you've ever seen one, they're really quite cool looking because they have a shorter power supply. And then where the front half of the power supply used to be, there's an internal three and a half inch drive. So there's, so it looks like a 2GS with a drive slot on the front. Uh, they're really, really cool looking. Yep, better sound, uh, SCSI built onto the board. You can use uh, mm-hmm. uh, SIM cards for memory instead of Apple's proprietary memory bus. Uh, there's a lot of differences. I, I don't know if Tony's going to be at – Tony Diaz is going to be at Kansas Fest this year, but when he does come, he usually brings one or two of these, and he's happy to, to let people have a look. And I, I think he – I know he's got two or three, and uh, you know one of them I know works, and the others may or may not. So, uh, But if he's there, definitely ask to, to take a look because those are really cool. 
Yeah, they really are. I mean, they're they were the the dream 2GS, especially like onboard SCSI. That, that's just fantastic. And the, yeah, the built-in drive is really cool. So, uh, you know, it's it's basically a, a a Macintosh 2 at that point. Like it's, you know, arguably as powerful and uh, in, a, in a much nicer package and uh, an Apple 2. So therefore better. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Uh, other hardware news. I guess if we were smart, we would have grouped all this together in some sort of hardware <laughs> segment. Well, that's all, it's, it's 2GS all month, this folks. <laughs> yes. Our carefully curated show notes consist of Mike <laughs> and I spamming stuff into a spreadsheet in whatever order we come across it. Sometimes like, duplicating each other's without even knowing it. <laughs> That's right. So there's, yeah, there's no rhyme or prep at all for this show. Uh, all right. Uh, so we've got a new 2GS vendor from Germany by the name of Byte Boosters. And uh, they seem to uh, be starting with the obligatory first 2GS product, which is a four megabyte RAM card. It's, if you're going to start a hard 2GS hardware company, that's required to be your first product. <laughs> that's and right. uh, so it's a, the it's a clone, of the GS, uh, clone of the GS RAM 3. And uh, so I guess if you need a four megabyte RAM card, there's now, was it 17,000 options now, if I'm doing the math right here? Something like that. Yeah. This one, um, <laughs> this one is nice because it's, it's compact um, and it looks like a fairly simple design. You, uh, you, the disadvantage is that you can't replace the, the onboard memory. It's soldered to the boards, but you can pick up a four meg board for $59 and 56 cents. They sell that and, and they sell a bunch of other products as well, uh, all through eBay. Um, you know, they have the, the GG Labs, uh, the eight meg card, I think is like 200 bucks right now. Uh, because they're a European company and they're selling on the euros, the price tends to fluctuate. But, um, I think you can probably expect to spend around 50 bucks for this particular thing. I just think it's really cool that there are so many, so many ways for me to spend my money on these old computers these days. <laughs> and they just keep multiplying. Yeah, yeah, the the uh, the price is right for sure on this one. And uh, in their eBay description, they say similar to GG Labs, so they're apparently trying to capture some of that <laughs> keyword searching. But uh, yeah, I think there are now uh, almost as many uh, 2GS 4 megabyte RAM cards as there are Atari podcasts. So wow, uh, that's, that's an interesting random statistic. Just throwing that out there. Drive by insults. I love it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's an insult. An insult that your your platform has many podcasts well, that's true, as yeah. opposed to ours, which <laughs> well, you're one, just watering but, uh, down, you know, the quality. That's all you're doing. Yeah, I, here in the Apple in the Apple world, we prefer quality over quantity. <laughs> that's right. That's really what it's about. Unfortunately, they got us instead. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's uh, this card does feature fast RAM, seventy nanoseconds, which means that it is compatible with your high speed Transwarp GS. So, if you've got a card that goes faster than fourteen megahertz, you want to look at this card for the memory. Mm, that's actually a nice feature. Yep. All right. Well, moving right along, uh, we talked a little bit about Lawless Legends. Uh, it is no longer the only uh, modern retro RPG in production. There's a new one called Nox Archaist, and uh, this thing's really looking cool. It's uh, it's very early in production, but uh, they've got a kind of a demo uh, video where you uh, you can see them sort of showing off some of the features of the engine. And that's uh, uh, you know if you liked Ultima, you will definitely recognize this. It is very very Ultima three uh, with uh, some nods towards Ultima four and even five and. Uh, uh, as I say, it's very early, but uh, that's kind of a cool thing because they're actually suge soliciting suggestions if you have features that you'd like to see uh, or whatnot. Uh, it looks like they're aiming for uh, quite a bit higher level of detail than the Ultima's ever reached on the 8-bit apples uh, because they're, you know, they're doing things with uh, uh, swimming. You can swim underwater and your character's, you know, head shows above the water and you can sink into swamps and uh, all these sorts of things. So uh, really nice kind of attention to detail while still having that very... Uh, 8-bit, you know, high-res graphics, tile-based aesthetic. So it looks pretty cool. Yeah, so this is from a group called the 6502 Workshop, and they have a website that uh, we'll link to in the show notes. And uh, I noticed this announcement actually over on Compsys Apple II. I didn't recognize any of the posters who are associated with the group, but I don't hang out there a lot. So I don't know, maybe they're famous and, and I'm just being insulting right now. But you can follow their progress <laughs> uh, at that website. It looks really neat, and I can't wait to play it. Yeah, I applaud all modern uh, development for yep. retro computers. Absolutely. So go 6502 Workshop, go. Butari. Uh, <laughs> Butari, yes. Uh, all right. Uh, so I guess our theme this month is friends of the show. A uh, friend of the show, Mark Pilgrim, uh, has got, gone and got himself a Pravitz. Now, we were talking last month quite a bit about the Soviet-era Apple II clones and how much we would love to have one and how limiting how we will never, ever see one. 
And then Mark Pilgrim goes and shows a bus, shows us up. And uh, not only he, did he uh, go ahead and buy one, uh, yeah, and he found one and bought it and shipped it to himself. Uh, he is uh, bringing it to Kansas Fest as well. So there are uh, some awesome photos of it on the uh, Facebook uh, Apple II Enthusiasts group. I will try and link to, the, to that, but linking to things on Facebook is a very hit or miss affair. Uh, so who knows if the link will work. But uh, uh, yeah, he's got it up and running. Uh, he had to do some minor repairs, and he's got uh, the CFFA card working in it. Uh, his Night Owl monitor works. Uh, he said he had to do some hacking, sort of unspecified hacking to Protoss to get Protoss to boot. Because uh, I guess Protoss knows it's running on a clone and won't boot or something, which is pretty interesting. I hope he writes up some details about that. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned, he's bringing it to uh, K-Fest. So those of us in the uh, Western Hemisphere, if you've ever wanted to see uh, one of these uh, Soviet, I think this one's actually Bulgarian, uh, clones, and you have uh, never thought you'd have the chance to, well, come to K-Fest. One more reason. Yeah, and even if you're not interested necessarily in the province, which I don't know why you wouldn't be, but... Mark Pilgrim is a really interesting guy, um, and and it's great that he's doing stuff uh, in the Apple II community. I know that at Kansas Fest recently, he did a demo of you know how how a software running within an emulator knew that it was running in an emulator, and it kind of blew some some minds and melted some skulls, and that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, he's been heavily involved in imaging, you know, uh, heavily copy protected discs. Uh, so this is, this is great to see that, that he's going to be there and he's going to have this. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what he does with it. Yeah. He did a great presentation last year at K-Fest about the, uh, infamous E7, I forget exactly what it's called, but the E7 copy protection scheme, uh, that uses this very clever reframing of bits coming off the drive. It's very, uh, very unique to the Apple II sort of way to copy protect something. And, uh, so yeah, you know, he, he has really great sort of deep knowledge of, of the, the file systems and floppy drives and so on. So I can't, uh, can't imagine a better person to have acquired this since, uh, now we've learned that Protoss doesn't run on it unless you <laughs> hack it up. So I, I don't know who else, uh, no, not, not a lot of people, let's say in the community probably could have, uh, uh, gotten that going. Uh, so couldn't have gone to a better home, but, uh. Yeah, this thing is really fantastic. Uh, it's amazing to look at. It's in terrific shape. Uh, it's got the serial key uh, key mappings on it. It's got a separate, what appears to be a separate key to to lock that in. So I'd really like to know how the serial uh, key character set works on it. If there's, you know, a second character ROM or a larger character ROM or how that's you know all wired up. Uh, apparently, I guess it's a clone of an unenhanced 2E. So, uh, you know, it doesn't have mouse text. So maybe they kind of wired up the serial the same way that mouse text is wired up. I don't know. It's uh, uh, really interesting to see, so I'm looking forward to playing with this thing at K-Fest. And let's see, uh, well, actually, speaking of K-Fest, uh, you know, uh, Charles Mingan, uh, a friend of the show, Charles Mingan, uh, did a really cool HackFest entry where he had did this kind of visualizer of how data is arranged on a floppy disk, and sort of through a bunch of Python scripts and so on, he actually generated a graphical image of where the data kind of lives on a floppy disk. It's really cool. And so it looks like someone has done something similar to Choplifter. Is that right? Yeah. So this is actually posted uh, April of last year, and I didn't notice it until uh, uh, <laughs> Paul Hagstrom, aka Yesterbits, tweeted about it recently. But uh, yeah, there's um, his name is <laughs> Christopher. I, I can't find the last name on him. Has written some software to, to basically uh, to create um, this little vertical column of um, what what would look to be um, like the, a, a sound um, waveform or something like that, but is actually how the data relates to uh, where other data is on the disk. And it's sort of interesting to see like the, the zigzagging pattern through the, the center of the disk and the end of it's all filled up. And um, I don't know if he's done a lot of other titles on it, but he's got a nice technical write-up at uh, the Random Variations blog and he references, uh, of course, Hags Apple and the Computist and uh, and um, a few other things. So uh, worth worth a read if you're if you're interested in in how data the bits flow back and forth between the drive and the disk. Yeah, neat stuff. Always nice to see community contributions from a new source as well. This is someone who I haven't seen uh, seen around before. <sighs> I'm so tired of this already. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, was it Jason Scott who said he wants your sigh as a ringtone? That was that was one of your best. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Trademark Mike McGinnis. <laughs> uh, that one was nicely bracketed by silence. That's too. right. Easy to edit out. 
<laughs> now he just has to All figure right. out how to hack, hack my iPhone and change my ringtones to that. <laughs> uh, maybe the FBI can help him with that. Uh, funny because it's topical. All right, what's going on with Apple, Mike? Uh, it turned forty, and um, you can't you can't click a button on your browser without seeing 50 links to how <laughs> Apple turned 40 and, and the pundits writing about, well, when I was a child and my experience with the Apple, which is the Apple II, which is cool and that's fine. But uh, there's um, sort of an overload of this. And of course, the on top of that, there are the doomsday articles. Can Apple survive another 40 years? And it's best years <laughs> behind a shot up already. Um but yeah, happy birthday, Apple! And, and um, I don't—I'm pretty sure I won't be here when it turns eighty. But uh, if it lasts that long, that'd be cool. Um, I, I put that in there mostly because it translates or it, it uh, segues nicely into our next section. All right, which of course is woos. So let's roll on into that. Give me a bumper, Mike. We like was, and we know you do too. It's was news. It's woos. All right, uh, Quinn, how much would you pay to have dinner with Waz? Uh, well, quite a bit, although I don't know if I would pay $15,100. <laughs> yes, that's the, the current going <laughs> price, apparently. Uh, Cult of Mac uh, announced back at the beginning of March uh, that you could have dinner with Waz. I think this is sort of a play on the, the dinner with um, Tim Cook that happened a while back. And um, it, um, so, where's his name? Uh, Matt Spurgle, who I think we've talked about some of the work that he's done before in, in uh, uh, retro computing and things like that, arranged this with Waz, and uh, the bidding happened on eBay. It's all over. If you didn't bid, it's too late. If you bid and lost, it's too late. But uh, for $15,100, that was the going price. So if you wanted to spend a dollar more, then it could have been you. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think anyone will pay $15,000 to have dinner with me, but uh, I'll, it's a dare to dream, I guess. Uh, I'll find someone. <laughs> Maybe Let's show up at your door. Hi, I'm here for the dinner. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if you write me a check for fifteen grand, <laughs> I will <laughs> definitely right. have dinner for, for with you. I don't care who you are. <laughs> okay. All right. We should say that money was for charity, by the way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Waz isn't just charging people to have dinner with him. He's pocketing fifteen grand. <laughs> yeah, that, that is not his style. No, no. <laughs> Um, well, while you're waiting to have dinner with Waz, you can watch him on Conan, which is, uh, he was, uh, on the, uh, March 7th show and that's, uh, now up on teamcoco.com, that interview. Uh, most of it, of course, was, uh, current goings on in his life, but they did have some fun stuff. They had his, uh, he brought in his, uh, UC Berkeley, um, diploma, which said Iraqi raccoon Clark on it, which is the name that he used to fake his, to, you know, as, as a fake identity there. And there were pictures, they showed some pictures of him with the Apple one jobs. And there was, so there was some interesting early talk there, early Apple talk there. I don't know that there's anything particularly relevant, relevant Toria. They talked about, you know, how the garage was a myth, but that secret's already out. So, but it was fun. It's nice to see. Yeah. It's a fun watch. I mean, it's classic was, you know, lot, lots of his, uh, sort of, Fast talking, declarative style. <laughs> so if you like listening to Waz, you'll get uh, get lots of it here. Conan. Unfiltered stream of consciousness. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and Conan is funny. So uh, Waz also did a, a Reddit AMA recently, and and um, that was interesting. Again, a, a lot of questions about like eh, the Apple Watch and what are you doing now? What do you think about the FBI? There was some early day talk. Again, I don't think anything shocking, or groundbreaking. Um, I, I was as I was reading through this, though, so it occurred to me. Uh, you've pointed out that sometimes we, we get these uh, Silicon Valley creator types in here who lack a certain self awareness about you know when they talk about themselves, mm -hmm. and um, not to say that they're not the geniuses that they say they are, because generally they are. But sometimes they leave out everything that got them to there. You know, so yeah. you'll hear things like, "I created this, and I made, I, I had these wonderful ideas for that," and. Um, so there's some of that in the article, but in some of the other responses, there's this humble, you know, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm just an average guy. And so there's this sort of weird dichotomy going on there. I'm not sure. Maybe there's some left residual stuff from the airplane crash in 81 still going on. I don't know. I'm <laughs> yeah, kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, but, no, we're kidding, of course. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's typical was, you know, he kind of bounces back and forth between being a genuine humble guy. And there's a little bit of, oh, I was the first person to ever do X or Y or uh, there, right. <laughs> there, there wouldn't be X or Y without me, but you know, yeah, that's, I think that's inevitable if you, uh, 
are so successful at doing something that that you really believed in. I think some of that's probably inevitable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and he also shot a um, – Reddit's been doing this formative mo moments series where they talk to – uh, creators and visionaries and, and geniuses about, you know, what was the, the, the moment for you when everything changed and the light came on and, uh, jobs shot or, uh, jobs. That was a boring, that would have been a boring talk. Um, <laughs> was shot one of those. It's about seven minutes long and it's, it's fun to hear him. I, again, we've heard this all before, but if you're just a, uh, a, a woos junkie like I am, you just can't <laughs> stay away. There you go. So you can celebrate Apple's 40th with, uh, all the was that, uh, it's fit to print, I guess. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I and I think that's all the woos for yeah, this month. I think so. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, I wonder how much of this sort of thing there is is, is going to keep going on. I guess as long as Apple is, you know, the most whatever richest, most powerful company in the world or whatever, they're going to the press is going to keep finding random milestones to celebrate and dredge all this stuff up again and uh, parade was around again. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, I guess if you're if you're an Apple fan, uh, that's a good thing. I always kind of wonder what would have happened if, you know, companies like Commodore or Atari as it was had survived and, and what that would look like today. And, uh, would we still be singing the praises of Apple or would we, or would there be like, well, here's the, here's what we think over at Commodore about that situation. So yeah, that's a really, yeah, that is really interesting because Apple is unique in that regard as having been the only company that survived those days in it's basically it's the same form. It's, you know, the same company making similar sort of logical extension products, uh, and the same brand and everything. So, uh, yeah, it would be, it would, I think it might be better if we had, did have sort of, if Commodore was still around making, maybe they were making PC compatibles or something, but they were still around in their same form making products that we could, you know, have more of a measured conversation about some of the events of those days. Like we had just, right. <laughs> like we just said, you know, the winners write the history books. So I think Apple is setting the tone and writing a lot of the history here, uh, much to the consternation of Atari and Commodore folks, uh, there was a lot of that in that book, uh, On the Edge, I think it was called, the uh, sort of History of Commodore, which is a great read. And uh, there was a lot of that kind of uh, sort of, I don't know if bitterness is too strong a word, but there was definitely that tone there that uh, people are cranky that <laughs> Apple gets to sort of say how it was <laughs> when uh, a lot of these other companies were doing, in many cases, much better work, uh, but in, you know, more obscurity uh, because of the structure of the companies. Yeah, and I think a lot of that's just born from, you know, the frustration that nobody's hearing us because the company that represents our fandom isn't there to speak up for us. So Yeah, and Apple Not that Apple speaks up for us. But. <laughs> well, no. Uh but yeah, the tone is different because Apple of course was a startup at the time and very strongly branded and they kept that kind of tone uh whereas, you know, Commodore and Atari were sort of already you know, companies doing other stuff at the time, they were kind of already corporate behemoths when they started making computers. So they had an existing culture that wasn't necessarily about computers and it wasn't about hackers and homebrew people and so on. Whereas Apple search started from that place. And I think I'm sure that affected, uh, you know, how they celebrated their engineers and how they promoted their products and so on. Yeah, well, and in fact, uh, Apple at one point hired uh, Chuck Peddle, who created the 6502 and, and worked at um, uh, Commodore for a long time. And he lasted, I think, three or six months or something like that and quit and went back to Commodore because he couldn't handle uh, the culture there. There's just such a, a different atmosphere on, on how development was done, on how people interact, the whole thing. So, Yep, but uh, Commodore did make nice file cabinets back in the day. That's for sure. <laughs> and adding machines. Yeah, that's right. Yes, they, uh, they they made lovely sheet metal products of all sorts. <laughs> all right. With that little dig out of the way, uh, why don't we move on to some feedback? You've listened to us talk. Now it's time to tell us what you think. Okay, what do we got? Ah, uh, let's. I hope we had a bumper there. Uh, <laughs> this is very <laughs> professional. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've got got a few emails to catch That's up why on. Why we here. get paid the big bucks? Oh yeah, big bucks indeed. Uh, I haven't even cashed my last six figure check yet. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> listen. Decimals at the other stop. end of the six figures, though. You know, that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just stop sending us money. It's getting embarrassing, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> And, and by that, I mean, please, please send us money because 
hosting it. <laughs> this is breaking, Mike. Um, okay. We if, if, that's what it, if that's what it takes to, to get you to believe that, then I will pretend that that's true. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, let's put that fourth wall back up, and uh, let's hear from some of our listeners. Uh, listener Rob uh, Dot, which I, I think is funny. That's how his name comes in on the email. Rob Dot. Uh, Rob says uh, he's got some interesting news for us on uh, Eastern European Apple II clones, which we talked a lot about last month and this month as well. And so he's got a great link here, which I will share in the uh, show notes. And uh, he says, love the podcast. Been a regular listener for maybe four years now, which uh, means you've Thank been you. listening longer than me, actually, which is awesome. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Mike and uh, Ken Gagne also, thank you. Uh, he says uh, he says he actually listens to it on a Windows phone. Yeah, I know, boo Windows. Uh, well, that, I think, yeah, that makes you the uh, only known Windows phone user, so congratulations <laughs> you're the one. for that. Yes, you're the one who bought it. Do you have a Zoom also? Is that, are you that guy? <laughs> Do you run Microsoft okay. Bob on your desktop? <laughs> All right, I just got those cheap shots out of the way. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes, uh, we got a letter so here mean. from... Uh, <laughs> a letter here from friend of the show, Michael Mulhern, who, of course, is co-host of the Retro Computing Roundtable. And Ooh, Michael, award, boo, Michael, boo. He won the award at this year's K-Fest for person who traveled the furthest to get there, all the way from Australia. Uh, hopefully he can make it again this year. Uh, he goes on to say that um, uh, number 56, episode 56, was the perfect length. Not necessarily the right length, but perfect. <laughs> and he goes on to say how it lined up very good with his uh, commute length and is looking forward to ever longer episodes. So the uh, debate continues on whether Open Apple is too long, too short, or just right. We may never know. Uh, let's see, we got another uh, email here from a longtime listener, frequent writer, Tony. And he says, I'm sure you've heard these details before, but I never realized how underpowered the Mac is compared to the 2GS until now. Of course, he's referring to the uh, vintages, the new old uh, video that I referenced earlier in the news. Uh, it's really a shame that Apple backed the Mac and not the 2GS. Of course, you're preaching to the choir there, Tony. Yeah, I think uh, it. Uh, I, I think a lot of people may not realize how crappy the original Mac actually was. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just dreadfully slow, and you know, no hard drive, single floppy drive. Software took forever to load. It took forever to switch applications. The software was just brutally slow. I mean, you could just watch it draw the menus, and so you know, the the later Macs got a lot better. Uh, pretty quickly, but that first one was really, truly awful. <laughs> couldn't even do done. color. That's right. Couldn't even do color. And the sound, it was just this kind of pathetic little bleeper thing. It could kind of play simple samples, but it wasn't a real, you know, sound chip. Uh, so, yeah. So that right. pretty much assures us that Andy Hertzfeld will never come on our show. <laughs> yes. And we may have alienated John Leake as well. <laughs> All right, and I got uh, an email from uh, KFest attendee in front of the show, Sarah. Uh, she's, uh, she's referencing, uh, we talked about the Usborne books uh, last month, so uh, mm -hmm. she also hearts them, so thank you for that. And uh, similarly, she uh, similar to me, she checked them out over and over again until one day they disappeared, and she was sad. I remember that as well. Um, let's see, she also mentions uh, that uh, she had the uh, Dacta Lego stuff at her high school. I, uh, we talked about uh, last month the uh, Apple II interface card to Lego motors and things that uh, was under the Dacta educational line, and I couldn't remember the name of it at the time. I knew it was a D something, but anyway, it was Dacta, and under the name, under the brand Dacta, Lego did a lot of really cool stuff uh, that you could only get for schools. So, uh, yeah, she mentioned that she uh, had that, and I think she's, yeah, she says here she still has some of the code that she wrote for that system. So oh, hopefully cool. So she can uh, dig that up. Yeah, it'd be cool to see that uh, operating again. And uh, lastly, a uh, quick note here from Antoine Vigneault, friend of the show once again. Uh, hi, Quinn and Mike. Thanks for talking about my Cracking Senses series that I like a lot. Uh, and I've added one using uh, Plamen's Trackstar 2 a must-see for the evil pirates out there. Of course, the track star is the thing that lets you see exactly which tracks are being touched on the disc, which I'm sure is very helpful for making uh, totally legitimate off-site backups of your commercial software. So he's added some new videos, so we'll link to that in the show notes again for people to check that out. Tony sent us uh, one more email. Uh, it's a link to Kevin Ryan's blog. Uh, Kevin wrote a program called Zoom Master on the Apple II um, and he has um, written a blog entry about 
uh, how he did that. And it's uh, some some interesting looks behind the uh, behind the curtain there. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar, um, Kevin also wrote. Um, let's see, he uh, he was one of the um, initial owners of Dynamics and created Arctic Fox. Um, and a bunch of other games that you've heard of, Sky Fox 2, Heart of China. Okay, so we're getting into the PC stuff there. But interesting uh, a little article on Zoo Master, which, like Tony, uh, said that he had never heard of this, and neither have I. So cool. Yeah, I had not heard of this either. We should maybe dust this off for a weird gaming segment. That's really cool. I think so. Uh, and there's, a, there's some awesome uh, photos in this article of uh, 80s uh, teenagers standing posing with their softwares. Those are always fun to watch. <laughs> and he let us know that uh, Halt and Catch Fire Season 2 is now on Netflix. Ah, all right. So if you're still catching up with Halt and Catch Fire, uh, Season 2 I liked a lot more than Season 1. Uh, they really got into more of the uh, legit retro hardware, uh, especially if you're a Commodore fan, you, you're going to love Season 2 because it's all Commodore all the time. Yeah, and the, and the first season was it was almost like they were scared to reference any real computers from the period because there was sort of the occasional obscure one in the background, or you'd see the corner of an Apple II, but you couldn't see the badge, or you know, there was they were sort of trying, and they all the computers they talked about were sort of fake ones that were sort of stand-ins for real ones, you know, the giant that's the focus of the first season, and so on. So they were trying to kind of dance around the real computers that existed. And in season two, they finally just embrace it. And uh, I, I assume they used <laughs> Commodore because it was easier to get the license to use the name all the time in the show. But uh, it was great to just actually see them talking about these computers uh, as they existed. Yeah, didn't they actually uh, disguise an image writer too with something else in that as well? They did, yeah. I think, I don't remember if that was season one or two, but uh, at a trade show. Yeah, it was season one at a trade show. They... Uh, they went into one of the smaller sessions where some a small company was promoting a new kind of dot matrix printer. And yeah, it was without a doubt an image writer too, dressed up with some bits glued to it, which is just comedy gold for, for an Apple II fan. Yep. Season two, much better. <laughs> Definitely. All right. That's all the feedback I've got. Do you have any more, Mike? Uh, that, uh, that's all I had. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment and thank all of the uh, Patreon contributors. Uh, every little bit helps. We appreciate it. Um, I, I, tend to I'm staying away from naming names just because I, I don't know if people want their names mentioned and I'm sure that I would forget and offend somebody so I'll just say thank you as a group uh, it does make a difference and and uh, we really appreciate uh, the love yeah I'll second that we uh, we really do it really does help with the show and uh, you know who you are those of you who've donated thank you very much on behalf of both of us and yeah our policy here is sort of that we don't you know want to name people's names on the show just in case uh, People don't want that, but uh, we'll occasionally use first names in the uh, in the email segments. But otherwise, uh, we prefer not to. But thank you all very much. And uh, that's all I've got, Mike. So unless you've got anything else, I think we can wrap it up. Yeah. Um, see you next month, everybody. Bye, everyone. I don't want to waste any time. For example, the first thing that fascinated me is you had, I'm going way, way back to the beginning, you had a great job, Hewlett Packard. You had a legitimate, you know, Job. Oh, I was working on the hottest product of the day, the equivalent of today's hottest iPhone and everything. Right. It was the handheld calculator from Hewlett Packard. Yeah. Right. And I you had this great job, and then you said, I'm leaving, I'm going out with my buddy Steve Jobs, Ronald Wayne, and we're going to make our own company called Apple. That took guts. A little problematic saying it that way, because we had two starts to Apple, not just one start. We had to start as a little partnership with one product, just kind of in the garage, just homey stuff, and then we started a real company. And the real company was when I left Hewlett Packard. I see. And okay. it was a tough, tough decision for me. Me because I wanted to be an engineer for life. I believe in engineers. Everything they do has to work, and that's a type of honesty, and I believe in it, and it's learned stuff. Right. And so, so I was going to be an engineer for life, Hewlett Packard, never go up the, the management chart. Um, and uh, I had to convince myself, starting a company, that's like, I'm not a company running person. I'm an engineer. And I finally convinced myself I could start Apple and be an engineer still. Right. The laboratory, just go in the laboratory and build my stuff. Well, time will tell if you made the right decision. Now, <laughs> we have, you know, we found here this picture of you and Steve Jobs with the original Apple One. And it just takes you back. It's such an amazing photo. That was the first one, and, uh, and, and we found uh, the first Apple One ad we found. Check it out. This is the ad for it, and the price. Look at the price. <laughs> $666.66. Why? That was me 
I was, was, I, was in, I was into repeating digits, and it came from, I had run the first dial-a-joke in the San Francisco Bay Area, the highest called single line number in the United States. I was just a young engineer, barely out of college. We had a monopoly phone company, only one answer machine you could lease, high price, could barely afford it, but it was, and any, but it got 2,000 calls a day, and anybody who had a similar number got 100 calls a day. So I changed the number, and then I tried to make an easy one, 2555555, and the phone company said, we're not assigning on the 5,000 bank. So I got 2556666, my first good phone number, and then I got a number with six digits the same in Cupertino, 9969999 for my dial-a-joke. And sure. I was into these good numbers, um, and you could never get seven digits the same in those days in San Jose, yeah. because they wouldn't share any of the numbers San Francisco had, and San Francisco had 7777777 and all those. So I got the good numbers. I was into good numbers, and I got uh, 2211111 once on a cell phone, and that was very similar to Pan Am, 800 I got all these calls, and people would hang up, and I discovered I was booking a flight for myself, and in my flight guide, I saw Pan Am's number. So the next time I got a call, I said, are you calling Pan Am? And she says, yes. And I said, oh, we were on our lunch break. What can I do for you? <laughs> I booked, booked my first flight. Oh, for, great. for two years, I answered every single call on my phone. Pan Am, international desk, Greg speaking, and my friends would shout, it's me, Steve. And uh, I, I, play, I booked the phoniest flights and times that I you, could. And I would tell people you can take the Grasshopper Special, where you go to through five different cities up and down to get out to, to Boston. Or I would tell them the Gambler Special. You fly to Las Vegas, you roll the dice. If you get a seven, the next leg is free. I had so much fun. But after, by the way... You're after, ruining people's lives! But how did, how did I not get caught? Yeah. It would, it'd be easy for somebody to realize who they'd called by mistake sure. and, that, and set the police on you. So after two weeks, I got that scared, and I said, so for the next two years, I would book the phoniest flights I could and then say, I'm just pranking you. Oh, okay. I'm not really Pan Am. Do you have, uh, and then they love that. But, uh, but, but so, so, so we had the Apple, the Apple One computer, and we were going to oh, get paid $500 per board wholesale by the store that was local, and well, we add 30% to that, add a third to it, and that comes out 667 Oh, no, 666, now, I like repeating digits. Do you get complaints then that it's, uh, it's a sign of the devil? The I don't devil? know if they were complaints, but we did hear from somebody, and Steve and I didn't know 666 was any sign. Yeah, sure no, we didn't did. even know yeah. it. No, uh, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> there are, you know, it's so interesting. There's been uh, two Steve Jobs movies. Uh, the one by Aaron Sorkin showed that you guys obviously cared a lot about each other, but you had a combative relationship. Was that fair? Did you think that was a fair depiction? The combative relationship was totally subtle. I never once confronted Steve Jobs in life. I would never say anything negative to him. You should do this. I would not even do right. that to a friend because I'm real soft, very, very soft. But those issues were going on in the company that were put in my voice. And one time I did make this, a statement similar to one of them right. to our president, John Scott. Like, blaming him for having had a shareholders meeting and hardly mentioning the Apple II and all the Apple II people wanted to quit. Right. So you did have... So I stood up once. This has been the Open Apple Podcast. Subscribe to us in iTunes or visit us at open-apple.net where you can browse our extensive catalogue of past episodes or read our blog. If you like what you've heard today, or even if you didn't, your comments, questions or ideas are always welcome. Send them to feedback at open-apple.net.